guy came crawling through a window out of nowhere. She woke, and she sat up in bed and looked at him. And he looked back at her, and he went like this. Man, I want to get this guy so bad because he's out here killing people. And now it's personal. I got to catch him. A short, mid-50s man gets a gun stuck in his face. He's able to disarm the guy and fire the gun. I'm a trained professional, and I couldn't do that. I look over at the car, and this guy's burnt. He's a crispy critter. We're not going anywhere with this case. We might as well wrap it up right now. I'm going, this is a loser. Detective schedule is horrible. You work two nights and two days, back to back. Four days on, two days off. So one day my boss approaches me and says, hey, we need somebody to investigate the burglaries. And I said, oh, well, there's nothing really to them, you know? A, a lot of them are, are dead ends, there's, you know? And he said, well, you know, if, it, if you can make it work for you, I, I, I'm open to suggestions. So I said, well, if you give me Monday through Friday with Saturday and Sunday off, I'll do them. And one thing I learned is, there's only X amount of burglars out in your precinct, and you have to keep an eye on them because there's patterns. The same guy may be doing two or three different burglaries a month, and you gotta try and identify those patterns, and that's what I was good at. I had one pattern, the press named it the Spider-Man Burglar. It was the Upper West Side of Manhattan where I worked. He uh, concentrated on brownstone apartment buildings. This guy would get into apartments while you're asleep. A lot of the windows were up in the middle of nowhere. Fourth, fifth floor windows, no fire escapes. Maybe a cable wire or a drain pipe outside the window. And this guy was getting in, nobody knew how. I come in and I get a call of a burglary on 88th and Central Park West. He had a two level penthouse. Turned out the alarm went off in the middle of the night. He went to see what it was and he found patio doors had been opened up and a stroller that was in front of those patio doors was moved across the room. So he knew somebody had been in there. Called 911. The patrol units responded, and uh, they didn't find anything. What else did you notice? Besides right, the door and the stroller. Later on that day, I get another call that there was a home attendant home with an older gentleman. She said a guy came crawling through a window out of nowhere. While she was asleep, she woke, and she sat up in bed and looked at him. And he looked back at her, and he went like this. And she said she laid back down, put the covers over her head, and this was like 4 in the morning. She said she didn't take the covers off till 7 in the morning. And naturally, when they got up, they realized that there was some property missing, and that was in the same building as the penthouse. I think it was a night or two later, he went back to the penthouse again, and the penthouse got hit for a second time. We couldn't understand how we was getting to this penthouse, because the only way to get to it was a fire escape. But in front of the fire escape was a wrought iron fence with razor wire over it. After a few of these burglaries happened, we decided to put together a task force. And now I'm back working midnight to 8 in the morning, trying to catch this guy, because that's when he's hitting. We have uniformed patrol units out, and we also have a group of detectives and burglary officers staying on rooftops, looking down, looking in back alleys, trying to catch somebody coming up, a fire escape or whatever. So one night, we're on a stakeout. We're over on 88th Street. All of a sudden, over the radio comes an alarm, and the alarm was for a building right around the corner from us. We go running over there. All the patrol units come shooting out. There's probably 20 police cars on the block. This is what we were waiting for, surround the block, and we figured we get this guy somewhere. We get there, and the owners of the apartment, men and women, they come out, and they tell us a story. The alarm went off on the top floor. Their bedroom was on the second floor. They said that uh, the husband, he grabbed the baseball bat. went up 
up the steps, and as he got up to the loft area, he saw the bathroom door close and watched the handle lock. And he said that's when he knew somebody was definitely in the house, and he went running downstairs, grabs his wife, and runs out of the apartment, locking the door behind them. So now they're locked out. Emergency services comes with their tools, they take the door, they go up, they do a search. I think we had a canine unit with us too at that time. Canine goes right to the bathroom door, the bathroom door's still locked. Now we're banging on the door, we're telling them, listen, open the door, come out. We go to the roof and we look down and we see the window. The window's open, but it's in the middle of nowhere. Nothing near it. It's gotta be 20 feet down from the roof and 75 feet down to the ground. We tell the guy, we know you're in there, come out and open the door. Nothing, not a sound, not a peep. We get emergency service, they come with their shotguns, they break the door down. The bathroom's empty, but the window's half open. We call up the print unit, they come, they get a good fingerprint. We kept that in our file, and we knew at some time it was gonna help us out. A couple of days goes by, we get a call, and a gentleman says, burglary in progress. He comes home, and there he sees this guy, who is Spider-Man, in his clothes. He's in the guy's clothes. And he motioned to me to go outside, and I'm gonna leave through the window. And he goes, and that's what I did. He goes, I backed back out my apartment door, I went to the neighbor, called 911, and then I came back in when the cops came, and he was gone. Now we have somebody that can ID this guy, and we were able to lift fingerprints at that scene also. So now we're starting to build a pretty good case. Once this guy gets caught, we know we're gonna get him good. Maybe two or three burglaries down the line, he hit a nice three or four level brownstone. Spider-Man had got in there when they were away over the weekend. It looked like he had spent some time in there. He drank up all their apple juice, and he took all their vitamins. So at that point, we knew we were looking for a guy that was in good shape, probably a health nut. I come into work and my captain calls me up and he says, go down to Midtown North Precinct. I got to the Midtown North Precinct and I spoke to the arresting officers and I asked them what happened. And they said, well, we got a call for a burglary at an office and uh, it was an alarm. He said, we got to the uh, building, the alarm company was with us. And lo and behold, here's this guy sitting three stories up. Three. This guy jumps out the window. He goes down two stories to a roof landing. He lands on that, and he screams in pain, grabbing his leg. So with that, we figure he's done. Next thing we know, he jumps up. He gets to the, the edge of the, the roof landing, and he jumps off of that down to the ground, another story. And he takes off down the block. By then, they had radioed other cars in the area, and he was apprehended running down the block. As soon as I look at him, I can tell this guy's built the V back, cut up chest, cut up arms. So I sit down with the guy and I talk to him for a while. I don't ask him anything about any burglaries. Just, we chew the fat for a while. Why is he in such good shape? And he tells me, oh, I'm a personal trainer. I said, oh really? He goes, yeah, a personal trainer on the upper east side of Manhattan. I do all famous people. We get into the interview room. We got you. Write it down. We ended up getting eight or 10 confessions out of him. One of the things I had to know was, how did you get over the fence to the fire escape for that one building? And he says, I put my feet on one wall, my hands on the other building, and I went foot in hand up the wall and then over the barbed wire and then up to the fire escape. And that's how we made it over the barbed wire fence. We also brought him in for a lineup, and the gentleman picked him out in uh, nothing flat. Way that we went to trial on that, he didn't do too well. I think he got uh, 20 to life. Turned out he was a, a drug addict, and I think he kind of, in a way, was looking for help, and he knew that this was the end of the line. Maybe he uh, felt he would get some help out of this. I don't think he thought he was gonna get 20 years, though. I guess at the end, uh, Spider-Man got caught in Detective Clancy's web, and uh, that was the end of his burglary career.
I'm working in the 81st Precinct in Brooklyn. When you work nights, right, 4 to 12 in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant Precinct, sometimes you never go home. They get a phone call that we had a homicide. And we go over to the scene and we notice from the uniform cops that there was an apartment building where they tell us to come up to the uh, sixth floor. And in the apartment, they said that somebody was killed by the bed. My partner and I go upstairs and we start uh, talking to the police officers who inform us that they noticed that there were a lot of crack files on the floor. The uniformed cops also informed us that they believed that it might have been a forcing where this guy was coming home and someone might have forced him into the apartment. The back, and we concurred with the same findings that the uniformed cops had. The individual was lying on his knees, uh, face down. I noticed through the pillow that there was a um, bullet hole through it, so we knew that the perp or perpetrators that were involved in this uh, executed this individual, but we didn't know why. They get a phone call that we had a homicide, and we uh, go over to the scene. My partner and I go upstairs, and we start uh, talking to the police officers who inform us that they noticed that there were a lot of crack files on the floor. The uniformed cops also informed us that they believed that it might have been a forcing where this guy was coming home and someone might have forced him into the apartment. We knew that the perp or perpetrators executed this individual, but we didn't know why. We do a canvas. Nobody saw anything. Someone uh, said they saw this guy come in the building, but that was it. They noticed him coming in and do what he always does, goes to his apartment, but they didn't notice anything else. We determined that he came home between the hours of maybe 7 and 8 o'clock and that the individual, uh, the murder took place around that time because uh, we know through the coagulation of the blood that was on the bed and the lividity of the body that, you know, certain things would occur within hours, especially when it's a homicide victim. But the crack files indicated to us that possibly this guy had a uh, crack problem, but we didn't know why someone would want to kill him. Maybe it was a bad drug deal. Maybe he bought some crack from a, a dealer and didn't want to pay for it. Maybe somebody tried to rob him. We had a, a, a lot of scenarios that we really didn't know what to do. We realized that this person who was killed worked at a church. We realized that he was an organist. He came from a pretty well-to-do family, uh, very well-educated. And uh, after we spoke with the family, they didn't seem to know what happened to him. And we knew basically whatever happened to him happened to him from the area. I get a phone call from a kid I know who's in the area who knew me, and he said, hey, uh, Parker, I got something to tell you about that murder. I meet the kid somewhere, and uh, he tells me that uh, basically he heard that an uh, individual by the name of Little Gotti and a and person named Torres did it. From what he was telling me about Little Gotti, that he was a really bad guy, that this kid was known to carry guns and to shoot. He didn't seem to know much about Gotti, but he knew about Torres. He knew that he saw a girl in the neighborhood. The kid said, uh, can you give me some money for this? So I think I gave him like 20 bucks. And he said, look, if I see this kid in the neighborhood, you want me to call you? And I said, sure. So while I'm back in the precinct, I'm getting nowhere with Running Little Gotti that comes up to hundreds and hundreds of people that use that name after the famous Gotti. A day or two went by and I get a phone call from this kid. And he goes, hey Parker, that uh, kid you're looking for, Torres, he's in the neighborhood. And he says, you can't miss him. He's wearing the military fatigues. He says, look, you gotta come right now because he may not stay here for long. We go over and sure enough, I pull up on the scene, I locate this kid within seconds. I jumped on this kid before he even knew what hit him. And I said, you're Torres, right? And he goes, yeah. So I told the girlfriend, he'll be talking to you a little bit later. He has to come with us right now. There's a hoard of cash there. This kid was started lying to me for the first five minutes. But then when I started bringing out facts to him and that I knew that he was there and I had a witness, he started getting a little bit nervous. So within 20 minutes, he confessed and told me everything. Little Gotti did it. 
Okay, he's crazy. Little That's guy. the guy you're looking for. Little guy, you know? Little guy. They saw this man coming out of a check cashing place in the neighborhood while they were hanging out. And they followed the man home to his apartment building. And when he got there, Gotti pulls the gun on him and they force him in the apartment building at gunpoint. While they're in the apartment, they took the little money that the man had on them. And then they made the man kneel down on the side of the bed. Gotti took a pillow and put the pillow over the man's head and shot him. He said they ran out of the apartment. He said he went home to where he lived and Gotti went to where he lived. And he said that he never saw Gotti again. He said, I never saw Gotti again. I never spoke with him again. So I asked him anything about little Gotti he could tell me and during our, my interrogation of him. And he told me basically that he was in jail uh, with him in the Queen's house and that they were incarcerated together, but he didn't know his real name, maybe an A, something with an A, Alex or Alan. He wasn't really sure. We take the kid and we put him in a cell. I start thinking to myself and I said, wait a minute, I got a brother who works in the Queen's house in the Queen's courts. I gave him the information that the guy's name might be Little Gotti and he goes, that doesn't help me. And I go, okay, well maybe his name is Alex or Alan. He's this age. I said, he had to be in this, in, in your facility between this year and this year, and that's all I have on him. So my brother was pretty sharp. He came back with two names, and he said, I got two individuals that fit that description from that time. I said, give me both of their names so I can run both of them, Mr. Check. And I got photographs of these kids, and I showed the picture to Mike, the kid who informed me in the street. And I said, look, does this look like a little guy? And the kid immediately picked him out. He said, that's him. That's little Gotti. I get a phone call from my old partner, Pete, about a murder that happened down in Park Slope involving two women that were alternate lifestyle uh, individuals, which means they lived together, lived an alternate lifestyle. But they were coming from a softball game. I'm so tired. And they were accosted by a male with a gun who forced them into their apartment. While they got in the apartment, he tied up one of the girls while he was raping the other. The other girl broke free and charged at him, and he took the gun and shot her in the head and killed her. survived drew a composite and then the composite looked just exactly like this guy little Gotti I was looking for I'm looking high and low for this guy little Gotti I'm looking in, in his neighborhood I'm going to his house man I want to get this guy so bad because he's out here killing people and now it's personal I gotta catch him and I learned of another shooting that happens a couple days later where a woman's going to her car and an individuals trying to rob her at gunpoint to take her car and he shoots her in the head but she survives I learned that it's Little Gotti. And what happens ultimately next is that they have a task force now trying to locate Little Gotti. He got into a dispute with his girlfriend. When you're really home, all you do is think about my girlfriend to me. This woman calls up and says, hey, this guy you're looking for, Little Gotti, that's my boyfriend. We immediately decide that we want to surprise him. We want to get this guy before he has a chance to get a gun because, because of the brutality of the murders and what he's done, it was better for us to get the jump on him. Once we're in the apartment, we hear a knock on the door. Open the door. I know you in there. Open the door. My key's not working. We open the door. Look, it's free. Let's see your hand. Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. And bam, we grab him. What stuck in my mind about this case was that it was really personal. It was personal because I kind of felt bad for the first victim that was killed, and certainly for the woman that was killed, secondly. And then uh, him shooting someone else again, it was just personal, and I knew that I had to go and stop this guy before he hurt anybody else. So the end result of this case was that, like the real Gotti, this guy is gonna spend a long time in jail.
I started out my career in the 7-5 precinct on patrol in East New York. From there, I entered the investigative track into narcotics, in which I stayed in Brooklyn North. And when I did receive my detective shield, I went to Manhattan South Detective Bureau, where I thought at the time I would be living a nice, easy life. But far be it from me, it ended up catching one of the worst homicides that I've ever had the experience of, of investigating. You get a call from St. Vincent's Hospital of a male shot. We respond to the hospital, we start talking to this male. He tells us he was walking down the street, went out for a walk and heard a ping and felt a sting in his knee. Looks down, he's shot in the knee. So that's the story he's sticking with. Where are you from? You know, we have to talk to him, he's from Newark, New Jersey. So I'm like, isn't that kind of a far walk? I got carried away, you know, I, I didn't realize what was going on, I would just, you know, I just went out. So he's sticking with that story for a good couple of hours. We start getting calls of a body that is found on Prince Street. So now we get to the scene, we set up a crime scene, the district attorney's involved, the medical examiner's there, but then we find out through identification that the body on Prince Street is also from Newark, New Jersey. So now we're saying we got a body here from Newark, New Jersey, and we got a guy in the hospital shot in the knee from Newark, New Jersey. This is obviously related, so let's go back and talk to him again in the hospital. How are you feeling today? He's still same story. I got shot in the knee. I don't know what happened. I was walking to the store in the middle of the night. I got shot in the knee. So finally, we leave it alone for a little bit. A few days go by, and now he's ready to be released from the hospital. So we call the district attorney's office, let them know that this guy is going to be released. And basically, if he's released, sent back to Newark, we'll never see him again. So the district attorney says, listen, can you try to bring him down to my office? We'll interview him. We'll see if we can get any further. We go to the hospital. We pick him up. He voluntarily comes with us. Now we talked to him for a good two hours. He goes, I'm tired of lying. He goes, I'm tired of this. He goes, I've been having nightmares for the last four nights. He goes, all I do is see this over and over again. All right, okay, all right, all right. This is how it went down. He goes, I can't lie anymore. He goes, I'm tired of it. I just want to let you know my brother's the one that shot me. But if you, you know, if you're gonna make the arrest, he goes, you have to put me in a witness protection program because there is nobody that I am more afraid of than my brother. You know, he's basically the leader of the blood gang in Newark, he goes, I'll never make it if he finds out that I told on him. So you gotta put me into witness protection. I said, okay, you know, tell me more. He goes, he didn't mean to shoot me, but he shot me. It was an accident. I go, well, how did he accidentally shoot you? So then he tells us a story as to what happened at the beginning of the night from, from the beginning. He borrows a girl's car, a friend of his. They all get in the car. They wanna go out to a club in Manhattan, in Midtown. Apparently all gang members, they all get together on Thursday nights, and they all go out and have a good time. They go out party all night long. So it's about 4 a.m. They decide they want to leave now. So they all pack themselves into the car. They're making their way towards the Holland Tunnel again. This way they can get back home again to Newark. So as they're driving downtown, a victim who's sitting in between the leader of the blood gang and the brother decides he wants out of the blood gang. You know, maybe he didn't like the pension system. Either way, he wanted out of the gang. You can't do this. You no can't do what? Yeah. This is our gang, man. What no, you talking gang. about? I'm out, man. You out. I'm going to show you out. But apparently he didn't take into consideration the ricochet factor on the back of a car. So the bullet ricochets around and hits his own brother, who was sitting on the left side of the victim in the right knee. They still continue driving. They get to Delancey Street. When they look over and they realize that the brother might not make it back to Jersey. He's bleeding so much that they decide, you know what, let's stop the car. We got to get him out. I got to call an ambulance for him. Our shooter gets out of the car, goes around the other side, opens the door, takes his brother, pulls him out of the car and says, listen, bro, I love you, but I got to leave you here. So he puts him out in the street, gives him a kiss on the cheek, gets back in the car, drives off. The brother's standing there, waving to him in the rearview mirror. He makes it down to Prince Street. They realize they still have a body in the back of the car. They pull over in the middle of the block. The two guys get out, they take the body out. They just throw him up on top of the sidewalk. Now you officially out, you out. Get back in the car, drive in. Now they make their way back. They cut through the Holland Tunnel, they're back home now. So the first thing they do is they go back to the girl's house who they borrowed the car from. They hand her the keys. They say, listen, uh, there might be slight mess in your car. You might have to clean it up, but uh, you know, sorry, no, nothing we can do about it. So take care of it, good luck. 
Thanks for the call. Now the hunt is on. We figured it was gonna be impossible to find these two guys. But lo and behold, uh, Manhattan South Homicide, within two days, locate him in his building in Newark with the help of the Newark, New Jersey robbery homicide squad. But they knew who he was, so they picked him up right in his building. You know, it was a type of area in Newark, New Jersey, where, you know, they don't rake leaves in the, in the fall. They rake up shell casings from around the building and they, they recycle them. That's how many people are getting shot in that area over there. And so I go out to Newark, New Jersey. He's in the interview room. He's sitting there by himself with his hands folded, staring, staring at the wall. So now I try to talk to him. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't even ask for a lawyer. And, you know, finally, after about an hour or so, I get out of the room. And one of the uh, Newark detectives pulls me over and says, listen, don't feel bad. You're not going to get anything out of him. The witnesses or the victims always end up missing or they don't cooperate. He's not going to talk. He knows the game. He's a stone cold killer. And that's just the end of the story. So I got no problem. So we're thinking we have a perfect witness. And you know what? Who cares? We're going to wrap this up anyway overnight. So then we call up the district attorney's office. We tell him what we have. And then out of nowhere, the district attorney was like, well, I don't think we have enough to arrest him yet. So, you know, I'm looking around like stunned, like, excuse me? He goes, yeah, you know, I don't believe the brother's story anymore because back when he was 10 years old, he lied to the New Jersey police on a report. So I don't think he's gonna be a credible witness. So we're like, uh, well, you know, what do you want us to do? He's like, well, you're gonna have to either, you know, find new evidence or get a corroborating witness for it. So then we're like, they're not gonna extradite him, they're not gonna do the warrant. And New Jersey had nothing to hold him on either. So basically we had to cut him loose. So now he's smiling at us, waving to us on the way out of the precinct. Take care. So we're like, now we're back at square one. We're like, I, you know, I can't believe this. The guy that we let go, the shooter now, feels somebody ratted him out. So he doesn't think it's his brother. He doesn't think it's his buddy who's in the car with him. So the only other person he could think of is this girl whose car they borrowed. The next morning, he goes to the girl's house, waits for her outside. She goes out early in the morning to work with her six-year-old kid. She goes to get in her car, puts the key in her car. He pulls up behind her. She turned the head. She hits the ground, leaves the six-year-old kid laying there, sitting there, and takes off in another car. So now she's gone. That angle's gone now, too. So now we have nothing to do. There's nothing we can do about that. So now we're thinking, we're just what all hope is lost. We get a call now from Newark, New Jersey, that the other guy we were looking for is arrested for heroin possession. They also tell me he's on parole. So I'm like, this is beautiful. This is great now again. You know, every, everybody's happy again. You know, we're ecstatic, you know. So by the time we head out to Newark, New Jersey, we find out that this guy was already arraigned and bailed out and released already. So then here we go again. Now we're like, this is ridiculous. You know, we're happy, we're not happy, we're happy, we're not happy. We don't know what to do anymore. 16 bundles of heroin on parole. Let me ask you a question. Talk to the parole officer, well, we're not gonna violate him. Apparently it's not enough. Like, what does he need, 17 bundles? Like, what, what is the cutoff, 16, 17? So they're like, well, that's the way it is. He's bailed out, he's on the street again. Basically now we're thinking he's gone. There's no way. It's, for these two guys to be sticking around now after they've both been brought in, it would be very rare for them to be staying in the same area where they were. So finally, two days later, we receive a phone call from the Newark Police Department saying, you are not gonna believe this. Your two guys that you're looking for, they're both dead. Oh, they're both dead. Now apparently, our two shooters are standing out in front of their own building again, laughing it up, hanging out. Out of nowhere comes a guy walking out like through the mist, staggering down the street, babbling incoherently. They exchange words, and within the blink of an eye, this unidentified male pulls out a hand cannon and shoots both of them at point blank range, killing both of them on the spot. This unidentified male just goes walking off into the sunset, never to be seen or heard from again. It's gonna catch up to you either way, whether it's the criminal justice system or street justice. You know, you can run, but you can't hide. And like I always say to myself too is, you know, if you wanna live by the sword, you're gonna die by the sword. And that's exactly what happened in this situation. I was working in the 108 robbery unit in Long Island City, Queens. 
when we came in on early Saturday morning, we received the call that there was a robbery and a shooting and that the victim disarmed the bad guy and took the gun back to his house in Brooklyn. We put out a hospital canvas just in case the perpetrator was hit in shooting. A hospital canvas has all the detective squads um, notified if there's a shooting. We decided to go to Brooklyn to interview the victim. The victim gives us a story that he went to Sunnyside with his son and his son's girlfriend. They were taking the girlfriend home. The son walked his girlfriend upstairs, and he waited outside having a cigarette. Give me the money, man. Give me the money, old man. I'll shoot you, brother. Oh, what are you fighting for, man? The gun went off, and he believes the guy was hit because the gun dropped and the guy fled. We asked him to repeat the story. He repeated the story again. A short, mid-50s man gets a gun stuck in his face. He's able to disarm the guy and fire the gun. Not likely. I'm a trained professional and I couldn't do that. We received a call that there was a robbery and a shooting. We put out a hospital canvas just in case the perpetrator was hit in the shooting. We decided to go interview the victim. The victim gives us a story. Give me the money, old man. The gun went off and the guy fled. We asked him to repeat the story, he repeated the story again. A short, mid-50s man gets a gun stuck in his face. He's able to disarm the guy and fire the gun. Not likely. I'm a trained professional and I couldn't do that. The story didn't add up. We couldn't protect him if we ended up in court. He eventually got emotional and told us the truth. His story was that he had his own gun, an illegal firearm. Keep it again, oh! ah! The complainant then gave us his gun. We didn't give him any promises. We were notified that the 2-3 precinct has a gunshot victim up at Metropolitan Hospital in Harlem that matches our description. We go to the hospital, interview him, not as Queens detectives, but just interview him as a shooting victim. The victim says that he was walking down the street in Manhattan and was shot in the drive-by and cannot identify anybody. We take the photo, we put it with other photos, go back to Brooklyn and speak to our original victim who identifies him as his attacker. We contact Metropolitan Hospital. They inform us that he left. He fled the hospital in his gown and his whole backside exposed. We decide to go to his address. We take plainclothes anti-crime cops with us. We go to the address in Brooklyn in the 90th precinct. We put anti-crime out back. We go to the door on the sixth floor. We bang on the door. There was loud music and a TV playing. That gets louder as we bang louder. All sorts of shuffling inside. Obviously, someone's not coming to the door. We get called on the radio, and there is a male lowering himself from the sixth floor to the fifth floor on a bed sheet, and he just entered the fifth floor apartment right below where we were. We go to the fifth floor apartment, and we hear screams. So we decide to take the door and enter the apartment. Female points down the hall, we apprehend the suspect. Get up out of here! Come on! Get out of here! You got me! Get out! Ow, my hand! Ow! 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 All right, you got me, man! We bring him back, we do a lineup. Our victim picks him immediately out. He's placed under arrest. The hand that he was shot in was extremely swollen, the size of a baseball mitt. At that point, nicknamed him Lefty because of that injury he had. What's that? He was removed to the hospital. We weren't allowed to stay with him, overtime restraints. So they sent a poor rookie cop with him to sit with him. And he was instructed that when he gets admitted to notify the precinct that he's admitted. 
was supposed to have surgery on the left hand. The rookie cop said good luck and went to make the phone call. When he turned around, our perpetrator was gone. He escaped the hospital and now is an escape prisoner. He's in the wind, nobody can locate him. As time goes on, months go by, we start getting hit with a string of robberies. Two, three a night, all with stolen cars. A few days later, was an accident on Skillman Avenue. A male black and a male Hispanic were in a car, ran a light, hit a cab. A few minutes later, with the uniform patrol on the scene, radio description came over of a robbery, a female getting hit in the head and her bag being taken. The getaway car matched the description of the vehicle in the accident, and the two occupants matched the two occupants that were in the car. In the back of the car, was the bag and the ID matching that victim. Uniform officers diverted the ambulance and they removed the two guys for arrest processing. We were notified, we went down to debrief based on the robbery, arrest. Okay. Get me out of here. Get me to the hospital, man. I wanna go to the hospital. 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 Wait a minute! And the same rookie Stop. cop that turned his back in, in the hospital identified lefties as the male that escaped him in the hospital. He was arrested, he was charged, he was taken to jail. Lefty is now currently doing 30 plus years in an upstate penitentiary. Sitting in the homicide office, it's one of these nights, it's pouring rain. Last thing you want to do is go out and uh, do anything. Well, sure enough, the phone rings. And we got a homicide. It's in a desolate part of the Bronx. And my first inkling is, it's raining. It's in an abandoned area. This case is going to be a big loser. So I drive up there, and as I come down this side street, and sure enough, my, my worst fears are confirmed. There's an SUV middle of the street, burnt to a crisp. I'm walking up to the car, I see the precinct detectives there, and I just put my fingers up and go like this to them. I'm going, this is a loser. I look over at the car and this guy's burnt, he's a crispy critter. Oh. Ah. You can't even barely recognize that that it's a person. I turn around and says, you know what, this will, we're not going anywhere with this case, we might as well wrap it up right now. Well, we have a sanitation cop that had seen three males in a white car pulling away as the car was on fire. So he started to chase this car. He lost it. The car was going north toward Mount Vernon, Westchester County border. So we took a shot. We called Mount Vernon Police Department, and uh, we asked them if they had any car accidents with uh, a small white compact car. And he says, well, they didn't have any accidents, but they had one that was abandoned. They found it on a street with the doors open, and it had apparently rolled and rested up against a fire hydrant which is kind of ironic being uh, they set this car on fire. We go to the impound yard where Mount Vernon had impounded the car. Sure enough, we find two gas cans and we find a set of keys to a GMC, which our SUV that uh, our friend was burnt in happened to be. We go over to the car, back at the crime scene, and sure enough, the keys fit. We're kind of on our way. We run the plate, we find out it, it comes back to a female in the Bronx. We go to see this female. She's denying everything. She tells us that, uh, you know, the car was stolen and she tried to report the car stolen. So we bring her down to the precinct. Uh, we just don't believe her story. And finally, she comes clean with us and she tells us, listen, my boyfriend borrowed my car. He wasn't involved in everything that went on. I know exactly what happened because he told me. Tell us what you know. She began to tell the story. 
with these two drug dealers from the neighborhood who used to use this guy in his black SUV as their cab driver. They used to get in the car and they used to make their drug deliveries, drop offs and pickups, and he would be their driver. Well, they went to make a drop and they took this fat kid with them. And they leave the fat kid in the car with this cab driver. Yo, you smoking in my car, you fat bastard. What I tell you about that, yo? Smoking in my car, yo, you never listen, yo. You just like your mom's, yo. Unbeknownst to this cab driver, the kid's mother just died. You know your mom's is a whore, right? She don't listen either. Well, the kid just snaps. Two drug dealers come back. Oh my God, man! Oh, you got me, man. Yo, you, you, yo, you talking about my mom, man? Right. All, oh, yo, you been at me all day long, man. She just died. You been at me all day long, man. He been we, we talking, man. What's wrong with you, yo? Open the trunk, man. So they wrap the body up and they throw it in the back of the SUV. They go back to the block. Call our friend in a little white car and say, listen, you have to do us a favor. We have to get rid of this car. Never telling them there's a body in it. They start driving to this desolate area. On the way, they get into a car accident. This dude don't even know how to drive. They got a dead body in the back of the car. They get into a car accident, so they just take off. It's a hit and run, and they leave. They pull over a few blocks later, and the drivers switch because they're arguing with each other. No, you don't know how to drive, so they switch. They get to the, the desolate location. They set the car on fire. That's when the, when the sanitation cop chases them. They lose them, but they're afraid to be in the car, so they abandon the car in the middle of the street. They split up. Two guys took the subway back down to the Bronx. One guy, uh, he says he took the bus, but I'm still not sure. I think he wound up taking a cab back down to the Bronx. This woman was cooperative with us because she had told us, my boyfriend had nothing to do with the murder, and I'll help you as long as you don't charge him with it, because he wasn't even there when it happened. And she knew where these guys were, were holed up. They were in an apartment of a friend of hers. So she told us that she would go there and get them out of the house. So we, we, we had staked out the building. when these people came out, she would start talking to them. She would run her fingers through her hair. And when she did, we would know these were the guys, and we would scoop them up. He walks into a grocery store. We grab him in the grocery store, lock him up, and we confirm that the other two guys are in an apartment that isn't theirs, so we don't need a warrant. So we send another team up and grab both of these guys, bring them back to the precinct. The two drug dealers give it right up. The fat kid takes a little bit longer, and then he finally admits that they were making fun of his mother, and we get, we get these confessions. So the fat kid wound up getting 12 and a half to 25. The other players in it wound up with three and a half to five years in jail. A case that we thought was an apparent loser right from the start, we wound up solving in less than 24 hours. <laughs> When you see a girl like that, and you know, right away I thought about my daughter, who wasn't much, pretty close in age, and you know, you think to yourself, you know what, what kind of savage, what kind of animal is gonna do something like this? He's thinking, there's still evidence in this car. You know, I can't get all the blood up, and they're gonna be looking for his car. What do I do? It's the last thing that you you would think that this kid would do is stab another kid. We know he's taken some rounds. We know he's been shot, but he's not going down. The guy's just, you know, I mean, he's, you could see he's still moving. He's, what the hell's going on with this guy?
an October night. It's Friday the 13th. Uh, we have a full crew of guys. We have a good night ahead of us. We're all looking forward to what our assignment is this night. And the assignment is we're going to one of the hottest clubs in the city. Our investigation showed us that uh, some of the narcotics had been removed from the people before going into the club, and some of the club patrons or security were selling narcotics themselves. There was a uh, overdose and a DOA on a, a pretty prominent person's uh, child. So we started an investigation into these clubs, and uh, the investigation detailed that we would go in, um, hook up as many people as we could to do buys, and uh, enjoy ourselves. It was like one of the perks of being in narcotics that you were able to go into a place like this and be able to sit and relax with your peers in a pretty chic place. Do some heroin buys, drug buys, coke buys, whatever they may be. So we were pretty happy about this. Although you work, but it was out of the, the norm that we normally deal with, with junkies and crack addicts and you know kicking doors open. And, and it turned out to be one of the worst nights. So the lieutenant says, listen, take care of whatever you guys got to do. You got to prep things, get anything ready. Uh, we said, do you mind if we get something to eat before we go? Because we know we're not going to eat until the morning anyway. So he said, sure. We hit a nice Italian restaurant, uh, kind of bulked up because we knew we were going to be working most of the night. I had a nice, uh, I think it was a veal asaboco that night, asaboco. It was, uh, it was pretty delicious. With this, we're all eating, everybody's having some laughs, and, and, and the lieutenant shows up, and he says, oh, he says, uh, we got a little bit of change of plans tonight. I want to just do a case by, and we ask where he's going to go, and sure enough, he tells us we're going to hit the projects down on, like, Avenue D at the Lower East Side. I can hear on the radio everybody going, ah, oh, shit, ah, oh, you know, and I'm feeling the same way. Anything can happen in the projects at any given time, and I was like, it's Friday the 13th, I don't want to be going into projects now. You know, it's it's late. There's nothing good is going to come out of this. Nothing. We get to the projects, and you have a feeling you know something's not right. You just know it. And uh, the undercover gets out. He's being ghosted by another guy who puts his locations and directions over. Uh, uh... And I hear him say, uh, he's hooked up, he's hooked up, he's hooked up with a male, he's in a dark jacket, he's on a bike, and <laughs> that right there is not a good sign. You know, bicycles and, and, and foot cops and cars, just, they don't mix. It's, the undercover does the buy, uh, buys a few bags of dope, and uh, he says the guy is loaded up. The boss's eyes, I could see light up, and said, oh, let's take him. Oh, shit. You know, like, what are we going to do? Now we got to go find this guy, and, you know, the plan changed again. You know, the first plan was, let's just go straight to the club. Now we're in the projects. We're just going to do a case buy. Now we're taking the guy. So that means somebody's going to have to do arrest processing. Somebody's got to take him. we got to search him, you know. So it takes at least three or four players out of what was supposed to be a good night just to babysit the guy that we got to process now. But it never gets to that. It gets to the point where he takes off on the bike. And now we're chasing him. We're now in a little cat and mouse game trying to find this guy. And we can see him, you don't see him, and cars are going, and guys are walking looking for him. But he's still there. He's not leaving. So it's really, you know, it's like puzzling. Like, why the hell is this guy just duck in somewhere? We wind up going to, like, the FDR drive. And I tell the lieutenant I'm sitting in the back. And I think I see him again. Let me out of the car. So he looks at me, he starts coming over towards me. I figured, you know, I don't know if he thought he was, I was going to buy. I don't know what he thought, but he comes up and he looks at me and I'm just ready to put my hands on him and he smiles and he's got a grill of gold in his mouth, you know? And the guy smiles at me and I'm like, holy shit. You know, like, what's up with this guy? My boss and, and Al out of the car and 
a foot pursuit starts, and we're running. Breaks off to this one of the projects, one of the one of the buildings, and I run around them because I think he's going to go through the door, you know, working in there. You know what they do, you know. So I figure he's going to go through the door and come out the other end of the project. And my lieutenant takes off the after him, and I go around the back of the building, and I hear on the radio because we got point-to-point -point radios. He's got a gun. He's got a gun. He's got a gun. And and the oh shit factor starting, you know, gun, gun, and now guys are flying all over the place. And your first concern is, you know, is the lieutenant okay? Did the lieutenant get shot? I think Mark or somebody gets on the radio, he or, or Big Mikey, and he says, uh, he's got a guy, he's got the gun to a guy. He's got he's got a, the gun to the guy, and he actually, what he does is he robs this guy's bike, and he starts all over again with the bicycle pursuit. I go and I get his bike because the guy on a bicycle always gets away. I'm on the bike, I'm on foot, I'm chasing him, I'm jumping over barriers. And this was going on, it felt like forever. In the meantime, now, the uniform guys are starting to show up. And I hear, pop, pop. Now I'm saying to myself, shit, they're, they're firing at a guy on a bike, I'm on a bike, self, get off the bike. And, then, and that's pretty much what I did. He abandons the bike eventually. We really don't know why it's going on so long. And, you know, he's been shot at. There's been shots fired. Um, I'm sure he's been hit, you know, but the guy is, like, nonstop. He's like a machine. It was unbelievable. And we get to a certain location, and and he's, like, got cover now. He's He's got himself some cover, and... Uh, I think Tommy Sal and, and and a couple of guys, they got cover too, and the gun battle starts, and it's pow, 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 and it's just going off. We know he's taking some rounds. We know he's been shot, but he's not going down. The guy's just, you know, I mean, he's, you can see he's still moving. He's, what the hell's going on with this guy? He shoots, they're shooting, and everybody's got cover, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and, and finally there's no movement. I think Tommy says he, he's definitely down, and we can't figure out. This thing went on for so long. How did? How could this possibly be? This guy's like Superman. You could see he was hit because he's got one of those down jackets on and the feathers of one and pulling out and and EMS opens him up and sure enough, he's got two layers of body armor in like a makeshift type of, or like a Home Depot type vest carrier that he has. This is this is why the guy is he's like unstoppable. At this point now, you know. Everybody's still nervous and shaken up. Um, but a lot of guys are, are, are coming to the location now, and uh, myself and a couple of guys that had the dinner just start losing it. You know, like uh, EMS is there now and sees me let let, let uh, Asaboko go. And are you okay? Are you hit? Are you? No, it's just it was just from that marathon. It was a friggin' marathon. He met his demise that day. He met his demise, and I lost my beautiful Asaboko dinner. Sitting in my car, my partner, day tour, nothing going on really. Um, I just lit up a nice big fat cigar I was ready to enjoy. And I get a phone call uh, from my boss that they found the body at an underpass. And it was in a bag. <laughs> nothing uncommon for New York City. I've been in homicide. This is what you get, you know. Just another day, another homicide. And we start heading over there. We go over and you can smell the body some of the decomposition as you get closer. It's one of those smells, you, you, once you know that smell, you never forget it. Turns out a homeless guy had been sleeping there, and uh, he saw this big black plastic bag and thought it might have been something in there for him, like clothes or something. He wrote, rips it open and gets a surprise. It's a young girl, about 19, um, who's obviously dead. We find, you know, we see later, she, said, you know, she was pregnant. She was seven months pregnant. 
when you see a girl like that, and, you know, right away I thought about my daughter, who wasn't much, pretty close in age. And, you know, you think to yourself, you know what, what kind of savage, what kind of animal is going to do something like this? Turns out a homeless guy saw this big black plastic bag. He wrote, rips it open and gets a surprise. It's a young girl, about 19, um, who's obviously dead. We find, you know, we see later she said you know, she was pregnant. She was seven months pregnant. So now we're at the morgue that night, and I'm getting a workup on her, um, her height, her weight, any kind of tattoos, uh, her clothing description, all this stuff you're gonna need so that we could call missing persons and give them an information. This way, if somebody reports her missing, now they can match it. Next day, we go to the autopsy. They cut her open, and they take out this seven-month-old baby that's full-term that could have probably been born right, that, right there and then because he was already fully developed. And it, it hit home. The tough part about this case is we had no forensics evidence. We had no witnesses. We had no video. We didn't even have it identified at this point. So now we got nothing. We get a hit on the fingerprints that she had applied for a job. And with that application came in an address. So me and my partner headed up to Mount Vernon and got to the address. And I had a photo of her from the autopsy. You know, I took a Polaroid of her face. Woman answers the door. And we walk in and says, oh, we're investigating a case in Manhattan. Um, wonder if maybe you could help me out. Uh, you have a daughter? Does she live here? She says, well, yeah, she goes to college. So now I got a feeling in my stomach already. So now we go in, and right on the dresser is a picture of her. I says, uh, ma'am, uh, your daughter, was she, uh, was she pregnant by any chance? Yeah, as a matter of fact, she's about seven months pregnant. Well, she has a boyfriend, and he lives out in Brooklyn, and she gives us his name. So now we got the boyfriend, and we tell her. Now we tell her, um, listen, she's dead, and uh, she's been murdered. There's, if any cop will tell you, one of some of the worst things you can do is do a notification of telling somebody that, they, you know, their daughter's dead. <laughs> and uh, we have nothing on it yet. And we start going through all these phone records. Now we identify who the boyfriend is through the cell phone records. Let's go pick him up. At this point, you don't know. He's a perp, he's not a perp, not really sure. But, you know, you talk to the mother, and she kind of gives you this indication. There's a couple other people we talked to give you an indication that he wasn't too happy about her being pregnant. And we go to his house, nice house out in Brooklyn. To look at him, you say, this guy's nothing to look at, real meek. Um, you, don't, you don't get that typical guy you're used to dealing with on a murder case. You know, you get this, this college kid, looked like any other normal kid, nothing arrogant about him other than he thinks he's smart. So we take him in, we get him in the car. It wasn't that he was reluctant, but he was like, oh, well, what do you need me for? And then we say, you know what? It's this girl that's missing. We give him the name just to see what's going to happen. And he's like, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, but I broke up with her a long time ago, a few weeks ago. So now he puts himself at least three weeks from the last time he saw her from when she's murdered. And we drive back to the city. And I purposely go past where the body was on the underpass. I look in the mirror, you know, I give him that look, you know, just to see his reaction. Cold as ice. We take him into the precinct, and we're, now we're trying to get his DNA to see if he's the father and all this other stuff, but he doesn't want to touch anything, he doesn't want to eat. So he says to us, he goes, uh, I don't understand something. If she lives upstate, and you say she was last seen in Brooklyn, what, what am I doing here in Midtown? So now we know, like, the gig's kind of up, you know? So then we hit him with it, you know? We show them the photos, you know, we hit, you know, don't bullshit us, you know, the whole nine yards, we go at him. We go at him for a long time, until the next morning. He thinks he's smart because he's a college student, he's a psychology student, so right off the bat, he thinks he's smarter than you, because you're just a dumb cop, so you don't know any better. And he's not telling us nothing. We ain't got enough to collar him, so let's, you know, cut our losses here and send them home. Now we gotta build a case on him. We were focusing a lot on him and her cell phone and him, his cell phone and his actions. And one of the detectives assigned to the case, Detective Brian McLeod, breaks this case wide open one night while sleeping at, in his bed at home. He's sleeping and he's like, you know what? We're spending too much time concentrating on the boyfriend stuff. 
let's see what we can get from the family. So now he starts going through these records, the phone records. Turns out she turned up, called the 1-800 number like a day or two before she, she dies to uh, activate a credit card. Call the credit card company. The credit card company tells us, yeah, then there was two, two or three usages you know, after she's dead. So like, all right, somebody's got the credit card, now we gotta figure this out. The credit card company tells us the call came in from a trucking company out in Brooklyn. Now we gotta narrow it down when the card was used and who was working at what time. Now we come up with this one guy. Turns out went to a college local, same college that the boyfriend went to. So like, okay, now we gotta get him in. So they show up, they pick him up, they bring him back. They don't say nothing. He asks, like, what's this all about? And he says, oh, we don't even know, guy. It's, you know, they played off beautiful. They're like, I don't know nothing. So we get him in, and uh, he's, he's a big, stocky football player, you know, tall, muscular. I said, all right, I'll use that to my advantage. I'll start bullshitting about lifting weights. You know, do whatever I can to, you know, get a rapport with the guy. So we get him in, and we sit down, and, you know, and I got the crime scene photos of the dead body in a folder. And uh, he's sitting down in the room, he's hanging out, he's relaxing. I said, listen, I just gotta get that, you know, some stuff straightened out, and I, and I, and I make like a, oh, oh. And, the fall, and the, now the pictures fall out of my folder by accident. So now he sees the dead bodies. I said, oh, guy, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I, ma and I make sure I make sure he sees it. Oh, I'm sorry, this has nothing to do with you. I'm, I'm, you know, let me, some, another case we're working on. So I take the photos and I walk out. I wait, and all of a sudden I can hear whimpering. He's crying. I said, this is perfect. This is right where we want him. A couple minutes later, you know, detective, can I talk to you? Oh, uh, well, yeah, what's up? He says, you know, those photos you showed me, you know. I said, yeah, what about them? And I said, think hard before you, you know, what you're gonna say to me. Because, you know, we know a lot more than what you think. He says, yeah, I know you do. Well, he goes into this whole thing about the boyfriend had called him a couple of days prior to her going missing and said, listen, I'm having problems with her. I got to talk to her. I don't want her to have this baby. But the baby was already at full term. She couldn't get an abortion if she wanted to. Says, later on, I get a knock on, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I knock on the basement where I'm sleeping, and it's the boyfriend. He says, come on out here. I got to show you something. Jock comes out with the boyfriend, and the boyfriend goes, she's dead in the back seat. And he tells him, the boyfriend tells the jock, listen, you're part of this now. You got, you know, you're, you know she's dead. You're, you're part of this. You got to help me get rid of her. The boyfriend brings with the car and the dead body a bunch of the black plastic bags we found her and uh, plastic bags, smaller plastic bags to use when they were moving the body around and everything else so that they wouldn't get fingerprints. So now, now we know why we got no fingerprints. So now they start driving around Brooklyn all night. They don't know what to do. Now they, they start heading into Manhattan. Now they're in a panic because the sun's coming up. Now everybody's going to see what's going on. So they hit this underpass. They figure, out oh, this is a good spot as any. They take the body out, and they, and they dump it right on the street like she was a rag, like, like she was nothing, just dump her on the street. So I said to him, I says, uh, do you ever think about calling the cops? Uh, or maybe... He says, no. I says, well, what do you think about maybe taking her to a hospital or something? You know. He says, no, I didn't. I said, I hate to upset you, pal, but you're, your culpability in this whole thing is pretty extreme, don't you think? You're going to jail. You, you're done. I'm going to lock you up for murder now. What, what are you talking about? I, I, it doesn't matter. You're part and parcel to this whole thing. You know, it's either that or you're going to testify against him. One of the two. So, you know, at this point now we got circumstantial evidence and we go pick up the boyfriend again the boyfriend turns around and he goes uh you i want a lawyer but because of the circumstantial evidence and the testimony of the jock we go to trial with it the boyfriend's convicted so at the sentencing the judge decides to give a little speech prior to sentencing he says you know i can give you 15 and a half to life or i can give you 25 to life you're a smart intelligent boy you've never been arrested uh, you go to college, and you, you articulate and all this other stuff. And he says, you know what? You should have known better. 
and he hits him with the 25 to life. The only sad part about this whole thing is he didn't get hit with two counts of murder. Because he should have been charged for that dead baby. The baby, because of the New York State penal law, has to have taken a breath. And because it never took a breath, we can't charge him with that murder. The patrol sergeant from the precinct called the detective squad. And I answered the phone, and I remember him saying to me, we need the detectives, we need them fast. We have a child that's been abducted from Elmhurst Hospital. Like any other time that you pull up on a scene, not really knowing too much about what's going on, you're confronted with a lot of commotion, a lot of people who are frantic, rushing around, and uh, you know it's important just to go right to the source, find out as quickly as possible what you have. Took the mother to the side, and she was very emotional. What I could get from her was that she brought her child, her year and a half old boy, to the clinic for a checkup. And she left the baby while she went over to the vending machine to buy candy. And that just for uh, you know a couple of seconds, she turned her head, and the baby and the stroller were gone. She didn't see anybody. Nothing to her seemed suspicious. She didn't have any reason to believe that anyone would, was following her, or you know not involved in anything that would you know put her in this compromising situation where someone would take her child from her. I told my baby, I'll be right there. So hospital security, they worked with us. They locked the hospital down. No one was allowed to leave the hospital. We took the mom, and we went back to the detective squad just to find out information. Did she have uh, problems with anyone in her neighborhood? Did she owe money? Could this be a ransom? But the other piece of the puzzle was to find the father of the baby to see if maybe he knew something that might be able to help us. He stayed in one side, in one section of the detective squad, and I stayed with uh, the mom on the other side, which is, you know, a technique that sometimes you'll use. You, you Sometimes you want to keep them separated so that you can ask one and then ask the other separately. You don't want to get the same answer from the two of them, you know, if they're answering or listening to what the other one might have to say. And he was, uh, he was in the stroller at the time when he was when sleeping. He left him. And he was had his, his green blanket and a tan hat, and he looked fine to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he was sleeping. Okay. Was there anyone else who was with you at the time? No, 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 no. I was by myself. We went through the night. The father felt that his relationship with his wife was not a good relationship, and that how could she let this happen? It was all her fault. You know, we went from sadness to anger to guilt, fighting back and forth, crying back and forth, which didn't help. We're just going with the fact that, you know, it's, so far it just seems that we have an abduction, a baby abduction. Later on, we went to her house, where, which was very hard for her, and we were looking for photos. We had task force, everyone out, still searching for the babies. Anyone who might have cameras, uh, local stores uh, that might have cameras anywhere on the street, time was not on our side. As time went on, the baby was gone, it became more and more dangerous for the child. The mother had taken the boy toddler to the clinic for a checkup and had left the child. I just remember all the media coming and, and calling and looking for information. We decided to go with the, um, the press conference. And she did an emotional plea for anyone with information about her baby to please come forward and turn her baby back to her. And, 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 you know, it was a very sad, emotional press conference. We had Crime Stoppers and the TIPS hotline and, you know, all kinds of 800 numbers out, giving information for anyone to call us if they knew anything that would help in our investigation. As time went on, we called in more enforcement, more detectives from other precincts to come and help, which is not uncommon. If you need extra help, it's there. You just, you know, you request it. And, you'll get whatever you need. So we had um, lots of detectives come from all different precincts and just come and work with us through the night. And again, most of it was searching, canvassing, uh, just looking for anything suspicious. Dad was cooperative, mom was cooperative. Uh, we interviewed other family members, neighbors helping, anyone uh, offering whatever they could do to help us uh, in our search for this baby. 
We're working through the night in the precinct on the investigation with not much to go on when suddenly we receive a phone call from EMS stating that they received a call from an elderly couple that found a child wandering aimlessly all alone unattended in a parking lot and we were wondering maybe that was our child. So EMS called us, they were going over there, and we just you know, jumped in our cars, and all of us went up to Risotto Avenue. And sure enough, we met EMS there, and they were holding the baby. And we just knew from the photo that we had that you know, this was our child. But again, we still were at a loss for how did this child end up on Risotto Avenue, which was maybe a half a mile from the hospital. Where had he been? Um, and so we knew we still had a lot of uh, unanswered questions. The mother and I were alone in the interview room after the child had been found. And the mom and the dad, they were happy to have their child back. And I assured her that now that, that we knew that the child was safe and we no longer had to worry about the child's well-being, I assured her that we would do everything that we could to find the person who caused this abduction of the child. And I explained to her that it could take time and that you know I would be patient and I understood what she was going through and how emotional it was for her for the past couple of days and that I would help her every step of the investigation. But it was important for us to determine who actually abducted her child. She put her head down on the desk and she was crying and she was upset and very emotional, and, and she said something that shocked me. I, I didn't expect her to come out and tell me. She had planned the abduction. She planned the entire thing so that her husband would come home to her and to her child. That morning when she took the baby to the clinic, in the stroller, she was with a girlfriend who was also a babysitter for the baby, and that they had planned that the babysitter would just roll the child out of uh, the clinic and then just take the child home where the child, you know, was comfortable and okay. They kind of had an agreement that, you know, maybe it would take a week or, you know, 10 days, but all this time the mom would be trying to reestablish a relationship with her husband. We said, okay, you know, we have all that information, we want you to just sit tight, but we also needed to go get the babysitter for what she did. Both of them were placed under arrest for endangering the welfare of a child, making false police reports, and a couple of other things. The child was uh, put into the care of um, Administration for Children's Services. They monitored the child. And, you know, after mom's serving time, the child was returned to the mom. And the mom was hoping at that point that this would bring her family back together and bring her husband back home. But in the end, he never came back. As a New York City detective uh, for many years, uh, you really think that you've seen everything. This one particular incident really blew me away. I was working days, and around 2, 3 o'clock, we get a call that there was a uh, young boy stabbed right after school, and there was hundreds of kids all gathering around after getting out of school, and there was a fight broke out, and one kid stabbed another kid. Uh, it looked pretty clear cut. Uh, Typical school fight, somebody got overheated and, and one kid stabs another kid. We go to the scene and literally there's uh, over a hundred kids all milling about, being interviewed and spoken to by the police, by uniformed police officers. We interview a number of witnesses and sure enough, everyone says the same thing. There was a, there was a stabbing, one kid stabbed another kid and they gave me the name of the kid that did the stabbing and we put a couple of witnesses in the car, we drove around and we saw the kid uh, right near the school. He was shaken. You could see that he was anywhere from 17 years old, chubby kid, well-dressed, looked like he's been well, you know, he's well, well nourished. It's the last thing that you, were, you would think that this kid would do is stab another kid. We put him in the car my partner and I, we drive back to the station house, at which point we're getting, we're getting phone calls on the status of the kid who was stabbed. And it looks like he is likely, likely to die of his, of his stab wound. 
but he hadn't yet passed away, so it's still an actual, just a, a stabbing and assault, a serious assault. And we're interviewing, we're, my partner and I are playing good cop, bad cop, and I was the bad cop. All right, let's go. Oh, let's go, I wanna hear your story. You ready now? So we're going on for this interview, and halfway through the interview, we do get a phone call that the victim had passed away. You're going to jail for murder. You're going to go to jail, and you're going to spend Christmas, New Year's, Halloween, Thanksgiving in jail. I want to see my doctor. He says he wants to see his doctor, his doctor. My doctor. Listen to me, your doctor. He now just falls off the chair in the interview room, clutching his stomach. So now we have to go through the motions and take him to the hospital and have a doctor tell us that he's, he's got heartburn or whatever, he's got an upset stomach or whatever, and just get the hospital taken care of, just to be on the safe side. We handcuff him, we take him to the hospital. The hospital is a very large New York City hospital. It's chaotic. And the doctors are more intent on dealing with stab wounds, gunshots, domestic violence, people needing medication, overdoses. The last thing on the list of their things to do is a kid with an upset stomach. We're there for hours. This kid's crying, and we're just, we just want to get back to the station house and finish up this interview, get the confession, and deal with it. After a couple of hours, we end up getting a doctor to take a, take a look at him. I said, Doc, just give me a clean bill of health. Let me get him out of here, and you can go on about your business. Now we bring him into this examination room, and the doctor, the doctor now starts to take a look over, over this, this kid. He now stops what he's doing. He comes out. He says, De Detective, uh, I think there's something here you should see. Surprised, I, I go inside. He goes, "This boy is a hermaphrodite." At that point, I never heard of a hermaphrodite, and he tells me that he's got the organs of a male and a female. He was born this way, and he says, "This is this is we have to get a specialist in here. This just isn't just something I can handle quickly." At that point, I look over to the bed where this kid was just just examined, and now I don't see a 17-year-old chubby kid who just stabbed another kid in a violent rage, I see this poor kid there who's got this problem. So now we get his doctor, and we talk to other family members, and we find out that, that this is a, he was born with this, and that he's been taking hormone pills until he reaches a, a certain age when they can now de determine what sex he's going to be the rest of his life. Um, we leave him there, we leave him with a uniformed police officer, and we go back to the station house, and we now have a different slant on this case. We start interviewing kids at school, we start interviewing teachers, uh, we started interviewing a lot of people, and we find out that this kid was so embarrassed about his condition that he, he would take gym and he would never change. He would never, he would be sweating at gym because he was kind of a stocky kid. He would just take gym, sweat, and put his school clothes back on. And one bully just kept taunting him and finally ripped his clothes off and found out that he had this terrible, terrible secret. And we find out that that bully was taunting him the entire school year, threatening to expose his secret. Now you're not angry with this kid for not giving you a confession. You f actually feel sorry for him. And he waited till the last day of school, and he just exploded. And in a violent rage, he stabbed him. The case was disposed of, I, I believe, because I never had to testify. I was never called to trial. I think the case was uh, reviewed by the district attorney's office. And I think a fair disposition was, was given in that the, 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 the kid received extensive counseling. He received the medical attention he dearly needed. I, I think about it, and I think about it over the years, and I think about what that kid is doing now, and it's something that sticks with me, and I will never forget it as long as I live. So working on the 105 squad, going over the cases from the night before, when across our desk comes a missing person, Mr. Rodriguez, a father of two children, two grown children, not married, and he has a regular routine, and all of a sudden, in the middle of his routine, he just disappears. 
So we take the case, we go to the house, we interview uh, the son and the daughter, ask them tons and tons of questions. Does he have a girlfriend? No. Uh, do you have any fights or disputes with anybody that you know? No. What does your dad do for a living? They didn't want to tell us at first. Well, you know what? You want us to help your father. We got to start talking to people. What does he do? Just, just my dad's a loan shark. He's a loan shark. He's working in the 105 squad when across our desk comes a missing person, Mr. Rodriguez. What does your dad do for a living? They didn't want to tell us at first. Well, you know what? You want us to help your father. We got to start talking to people. What does he do? Just, just my dad's a loan shark. So your dad's a loan shark. Okay. There's plenty of loan sharks, especially in New York. Can you describe your father for us? Sure, and here's a picture. Okay. The guy was tiny. And because he's a tiny, quiet man, and he's a loan shark, he needs somebody to collect his money. He's called the enforcer. Describe him? Yeah. He is six foot three, six foot six, six foot eight, somewhere around there. Close to 400 pounds. I go, well, hold on. No way. Do you know where this enforcer lives? Yes. So we got the address. We knock on the door, and a female answers. She is totally upset. Totally upset. She goes, my husband just told me that he killed Mr. Rodriguez. I go, really? Do you know any other, you know, what, when did this happen? Well, he didn't say. Well, how'd he do it? He didn't say. Would you mind? We take it back to the precinct. We want to get your statement. She goes, OK. We back up off the property, park down the block, and we sit and wait. Usual cars going up and down the street, nothing in particular. Then we see this one van coming at us. I said, that's the enforcer. Well, how do you know? Because it's tilted on one side, and he's driving, and that's the side it's tilted on. We zip up, jump out, identify ourselves. We need you to come with us. Do I have to? Yes. I do it the easy way or the hard way. But it turns out, and I find this all the time, the bigger the guy, the more quiet and calm they are. We get him back to the precinct. We bring him upstairs. We sit him down in a room, nice and comfortable. This was the easiest confession ever. And apparently, this thing was weighing on his mind for weeks, and it was just eating at him. Because even though he's big and tremendous, he never really had to hurt anybody. He says, well, I'm a heavy gambler. And as time went on, I would gamble more and more. And then I started borrowing money from my boss, Mr. Rodriguez. And I owed him so much money, he was getting angry because the interest rate, the VIG, was so high, and I wasn't paying him back. I needed it as a friend, right? I gave it to you. And I expect it back the same way I gave it to you. What does Robert do? He pulls out a 22 out of his pocket. I'm gonna get it to you. I'm not here to I'm play games with to you. you. know what happens to people that don't pay. Now, I know everybody who's a cop, detective, and in law enforcement know what a 22 looks like. This is a 38. Let's make it safe. A 22 is about this big. And I'm thinking to myself, how do you get his big hand to the trigger, to pull the trigger? He said, I panicked. I didn't know what to do. He says, I took some cloth from the back seat. I wiped the blood off the windshield because the blood splattered. Wiped the steering wheel down. And he looks in the back seat, and he sees a hat. So he takes this hat, and he puts it on Mr. Rodriguez, who is now dead. He goes, well, I, start, I drove off the main area. And I just got on the main highway, and I started driving. Go, Where were you going? He goes, I have no idea. He goes, you better put the seatbelt on him. Now he's driving upstate. Now he's going through toll booths. And he didn't have easy pass, so he's paying the toll booth clerk. And every time he would go through a toll booth, he's like, I hope they don't see it. I hope they don't see So he's driving upstate, and he, he doesn't know where to go. So he pulls over to the side of the road, just so he can get his bearings. So he comes up with the bright idea that he's going to bury the body upstate in the woods in a desolate area. Puts the car in drive. Hits the gas, not going anywhere. The mud, and he's stuck. He, he doesn't know what to do. He's trying, he's trying. As he's trying to push the car out himself, this van pulls up behind him. So the guy gets out. So he's like, you have your friend, you know, go into the driver's seat, and we'll push it out. He's like, he, he's sleeping. He can't 
You know, let's, let's just leave him be. I don't want to disturb him. Two, three. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the family drives off waving. And he drives off through a couple more toll booths, finds a desolate area, and he says to himself, this is good place any. I just gotta get this done. He's looking for something to dig with, opens the trunk of the car. Lo and behold, there's a shovel. Mr. Rodriguez has a shovel in his car. Wow. Digs a shallow grave, takes the body, puts him in, takes the weapon, throws it in, covers up the grave, and drives off. And he's thinking, there's still evidence in this car. You know, I can't get all the blood up, and they're going to be looking for his car. What do I do? Ah, bright idea. Let's burn it. We get his confession down on paper, and we ask him, we need you to come with us and show us where this body is. We have emergency service up there, and they start the digging. And when they finally got down to where the body is, uh, the body was covered with maggots. And everybody's getting sick to the stomach from the smell. And I said, all right, we're going to take, you know, the enforcer. We're going to take him in the car. We'll bring him back to the precinct, and we're going to lodge him for court. Oh, no. The boss says, <laughs> we'll take him. You take the clothing, the maggots, the shoes, the socks, the hat, the gun. You take all that in your car. God, really? Yes. The smell was horrendous. Stunk for hours on the drive back to New York. We roll the windows down, helped a little bit, not enough. We get back to the precinct, we bring it to the desk officer. He's like, no, don't want it here. Get rid of it. I don't want it. That stinks. Get it out of my station house. Grab all the clothing, the maggots. We ran up to the roof. There's a clothesline. It's perfect. You know, one guy will stay here overnight, guard the door, chain of evidence. And now the enforcer is doing 20 years to life in upstate New York. This is what you call murder, dirty laundry style in New York City. He slows down, he goes into the lane and proceeds to roll down the window and fire into the car. He thought she was nice, he wanted to meet her. Of course, that's not true, because if you want to meet somebody, you ring their doorbell, you don't climb in through the, the kitchen window. Basically, when we got back to the precinct, he just looked at me and he said, I just needed to do it because they didn't show me any love. Homicide cases are really very, very personal for detectives. You have more of a sense of who the person is in death than many of their closest friends have of who they were in, in life. Working in the homicides in New York, it's the ultimate crime. The taking of one life is kind of the pinnacle of a criminal act. And to investigate it, you're at the top of your game. You're working towards finding the person that's responsible for doing that. It was a major holiday, and a family, a husband, wife, and their three-year-old daughter were coming back from having dinner and celebrating the holiday with their family. And they got involved in a road rage incident. The car is following too close. The driver is, just taps his brakes. The car following this car was, becomes irate. He slows down. He goes into the lane, parallel with the car, and proceeds to roll down the window and fire into the car, shattering the rear window of the car. One bullet actually enters the trunk and exits in between the three-year-old's car seat, in between her legs, doesn't hurt the baby in the car. And another bullet lodges in the wife's head. You okay? Oh, my God. Now, the husband is frantic. He's trying to get out of the way. 
he speeds up, he changes lanes, he gets off at the exit, he's not really 100% sure of the neighborhood. And because it's a holiday weekend, stores are closed and it's a residential neighborhood and he's not familiar with the neighborhood. So he drives frantically trying to find a place to call 911, a place to seek help. Ultimately he does, he finds a gas station, call 911, we all respond. But at this point, he's away from the crime scene and, he's, and because of the moment, he's not sure where this actually happened. He's not sure of the make or model of the car because it was 10 o'clock at night and all he saw was lights in, the, in his rearview mirror. So we don't have a witness, we don't have a weapon, we don't have any crime scene to really work on. Ultimately, everybody, you know, the, the wife goes to the hospital where she expires and she dies. We do the best we can, but under the circumstances, we had nothing to work on. We work on it, the news picked it up and we were seeking help through tips. And we got a few calls, but nothing that would really help us. The case is dead. Now, a year later, on that same holiday, at the same time, we block off this major highway. And we had cars backed up for miles. But it, it's something that had to be done. We were just hoping that the same people who were visiting family then are visiting family again now. And we really didn't get anything. What happens now is kind of odd. Detectives from another precinct are investigating a burglary. And they go to the suspect's house. They meet this, this suspect in this burglary, and the suspect says, you haven't got anything on me. You, you, you could search my room if you'd like. You, you got the wrong guy. So these detectives go into his bedroom. They noticed on a vanity mirror a little picture that was, that was cut out of a newspaper at the time of this homicide of this little baby girl. <laughs> Here is a kind of a disheveled, disgruntled person, and he's got this picture of this little baby. So now questions are raised, and we start to look into this further, and we start to work on this person now as a possible suspect. He had a history of stalking women. He was kind of an oddball character, had a volatile temper. The person that he was alleged to have bur burglarized her house, he was also stalking her. And we found out that she had filed a complaint on this same holiday at the, around the same time that this homicide occurred, which now raises our elevation of this guy now maybe may the suspect that we're looking for. So we now found out about his employment. Now his employment would have taken him directly from his house to where he works in the same highway that where this incident occurred. And sure enough, he works the midnight shift. So he was on his way to work, possibly on the same road. So all the things are starting to fit in. It's not really a, a lot to go to a district attorney with and really prove a case. We let the burglary case go through the courts and he pleads guilty and he gets sentenced to 18 months and he gets sent upstate. At which time, before he gets lodged into the state system, we we put him in a cell where I have an informant. I said, you're gonna get a new roommate and I want you to be his best friend. And he wants to know more. He wants to be helpful. He wants to do anything because I've been doing things for him all this time. He wants to be overly helpful. Tell me, what should I ask him? And I said, you're not gonna ask him anything. You don't know anything. You're just gonna become his best friend. So for three months, we let them become friends and I get calls every day telling me, Tom, this guy is nuts. He's got some issues, he's, he's, he's nuts. He's, he's kind of got a strange temper, he's got a strange temperament. He's just an oddball. So just be his friend, just be a nice guy to him and don't worry about it, you'll know. You'll know when something happens. And then myself and two other detectives, we go up to see our, our murder suspect and we bring him into a room where we start to just scream at him and say, you're our, you're our guy, you're the guy we're gonna go after, we know you were involved in this, and he's, he's denying it, but you, you could just see that the blood pressure's rising, he's turning red in the face, the veins in his neck are popping out, and he's just beside himself with anger, which was a perfect time for us to just close up our books and walk out. Now the corrections officers come up, they pick him up, and they bring him to his cell. And then we just sit by the phone. And not less than 24 hours later, I get a call from my guy. And he says, Tom, he goes, you're not gonna believe what this guy told me. I says, try me. 
<laughs> and he proceeds to tell me the entire story of what happened, that he was stalking a woman that he worked with, and he thinks he may have been seen, and he was all upset, and he had to race from that person's house to home to change into his work clothes, get back on the highway, and go to work and not be late. It all fit in, and he now details everything about the homicide. Everything. We go to the district attorney with this, and the district attorney says it's great, and we know that he's the guy, but to, to successfully prosecute this case, you can't take the sole information of a convicted felon, especially one who spent most of his adult life in jail. Around the same time, my informant and our suspect are in anger management classes at the correctional facility, where you could see that this guy is just, he's just beside himself with anger. And he gets up in front of this anger management class and proceeds to say that whoever ratted him out, he's gonna kill. He's gonna find out who did this to him and he's gonna kill him. That's the end of the relationship between our suspect and our informant. So they take him out of a cell, they put him in solitary confinement, and they're trying to figure out what to do with him because he's still got about six months left of his 18-month burglary sentence. We realize the district attorney needs more. We can't use this informant any longer. We know that he's gonna be transferred to finish out his sentence, so we put him in a cell with a second informant that we have. He's whisked in the middle of the night, he's put on a bus, and he's taken to this second prison where he's thrust into a cell with another guy, where he proceeds to now not only tell the story, but add little things that really tighten up the case against him. Second informant calls up and tells us the story. We said, put everything on paper, write everything down, and thank you. We go to the grand jury, we indict him for murder, and now the big gate opens up, out comes our suspect, happy as a clam, he's got a big smile on his face, and we just told him that he's going back to jail. We put the handcuffs on him, and that's where he is today. You're never gonna bring the woman back, but you are gonna give the husband closure, which ultimately, every victim's family needs that. There's a, such a tremendous job satisfaction. It's, it's, it's just a, a, a wonderful feeling. It was late on a Friday afternoon. We were all getting ready to go home for, you know, a nice weekend. When we get a call from the desk sergeant in the precinct, we had a female Hispanic laying at the bottom of a set of stairs, unconscious. We respond over, myself and three or four detectives. And when we arrive, of course, the usual crowd had gathered. You know, the carnival-like atmosphere of a crime scene. When we walk inside the building, we look and there's a female Hispanic, probably in her late 60s, early 70s, laying at the bottom of the stairs, head first, with uh, a pool of blood. No idea. A bag of groceries that she apparently was carrying was strewn all over the place. We had a feeling that what we had was a little bit more than a slip and fall. When we walk inside the building, we look, and there's a female Hispanic, probably in her late 60s, early 70s, laying at the bottom of the stairs, head first, with uh, a pool of blood. No idea. Just a bag of groceries that she apparently was carrying was strewn all over the place. We had a feeling that what we had was a little bit more than a slip and fall. She looked like she had fallen from, from quite a distance. At the scene, we have the superintendent of the building, who's hysterical crying. Turns out that this is his wife. This is his whole world. He has no children. We interviewed him. They had moved here probably 40 years ago from a Latin American country, and they'd made a life together in America. We found out what her routine was. She was a nurse's aide. 
was on her way home, stopped at the supermarket, was gonna make a special dinner to celebrate his birthday. Now that, you know, that birthday is, is, is just shattered, that all, his entire world is shattered. And we have nothing. We have absolutely nothing. We have, we have no witnesses, we have no motive, we have no reason. She had a fanny packet in the front that was still there. She had, uh, her keys were still there, her money was still with her, her wallet was still with her. We knew we had a homicide. We just didn't know why, we didn't know how, we had no motive. We find out that, that her husband is a soccer coach for many of the youth in the neighborhood. Um, having never had any children of their own, they kind of adopted all, all kinds of kids in the neighborhood as, you know, they're, they're adoptive kids. They were just beloved by everybody. And, you know, the neighborhood was, was in shock that this woman, you know, met such an untimely death. When we were up in the apartment, we asked for a couple of pictures of, of him and her that we might possibly use in, in wanted posters down the road, or uh, we might appeal to the local newspaper to see if they could help us solve the case. He gives us this picture, and it's, sure enough, it's a picture of the two of them on vacation, and they're just, you know, having the time of their lives. And, you know, this is, this is the picture it hands me, and it just, you know, it struck a nerve for me because this, th these lives are shattered now. We're front stage on something that, that's just so tragic. We bring him back to the precinct, and we take a picture of him also. For no other reason than to have a picture of him on file. As luck would have it, we start to get a pattern of female Hispanics are robbed in the lobby of their apartment buildings in a pretty tight cluster to where this happened. So we know now that if we can solve this robbery, we can find out who's done this. And we get our break one Saturday afternoon. Two cops on patrol bring a victim of one of these robberies up. Victim, probably the robbery happened maybe five minutes in the past. And we go to an area in the precinct where someone, if they stole jewelry, would likely to go pawn it. We go into one of the pawn shops, and sure enough, we find her jewelry. And no sooner do we get out in the street with our recent victim, she starts to tremble uncontrollably. And we was asking her, what's, you know, what's wrong? And she just, she's speechless, but she's pointing at some guy sitting on a bicycle. So I ask, well, why are you pointing? What, what's with the guy on the bicycle? And she goes, that's him. That's, that's the man that robbed me. So we walk over to him, myself and another detective, and this guy, his heart is beating out of his chest, and he's in a real cold sweat. So we know, we know what, that we have something here. We transport him into the precinct, and to kill a little time, we put him in some lineups, and he gets identified by a few more victims. Number two. Number two, you sure? But we still don't have that one thing we want. We know that he, he's involved with, with, our, with our victim, and we want him, we, we want to get that confession out of this world. You're from around here. You know this. We're sitting in an interrogation room with him for a real long time, number of hours. And little by little, he's, he's coming around and, and you know, he says, I, I know what you guys are looking for. He gives, he kind of gives us teases. He teases us and, and lets us know that he, he's, gonna, he's gonna tell us what we need to know, but he's gonna tell it to us on, on his time frame. And now the interesting thing, or the, or the ironic thing, we know that our, vic our victim's husband had been a soccer coach in the neighborhood, and, and he was just like such a great, great guy to everyone. And, and it turns out that this kid, sure enough, had played soccer for our victim's husband. So we have now a little bit of a, a, a personal appeal on this. And we're, and we're waiting. We're, we're not going to use it quite yet, but, but uh, we're waiting for the right time to, to spring that on him. So he tells us, you know, listen, I, I'm getting tired, I, and I need to go to sleep. You know, wait till the morning and I'll tell you guys what you need to know. Now, we had taken pictures of the victim at the scene. We had the picture of the victim uh, and her husband on vacation, and we had the picture of the victim's husband hysterical crying the day that, that his wife was killed. So, you know, I looked at him and I said, listen, before you go to sleep, I just want to show you a couple pictures and I want you to get a good mind's eye on these. And uh, I throw down a picture of the happy couple with the with the drinks, with the umbrellas. I throw down a picture of the, our victim laying dead, and I throw down a picture 
of our victim's husband. Now he realizes that he's just killed his soccer coach's wife. And um, he just looked at me and he goes, you know, you know I can't go to sleep now. I said, I didn't think you could. And he said, I don't know why she wouldn't just give me the fanny pack. She just, if she would have just given me the fanny pack, none of this would have happened. She had only given me her purse. We're all looking good. Sure enough, he tried to pull the fanny pack off of her, and down the stairs she went backwards, smacks her head on the bottom landing, and, and it kills her. You know, and the thing about this case is, you know, detectives live and breathe their cases. You know, homicide cases are really very, very personal for detectives. You have more of a sense of who the person is in death than many of their closest friends have of who they were in, in life. And there's always that one case that, that has your heart as, a, as an investigator. And uh, in, in this case was it for me. After we solved the case, I was probably up for about 25 hours. The crime scene was probably only two or three blocks from the precinct. And um, I walked down the block, and uh, there was our victim's husband with, with a bunch of his friends on, on the stoop. And um, he knew why I was there. He came right over to me and he just uh, he started crying and you know I looked him in the eye and I, I, I said we we found the person that, that killed your wife and um, you know it was probably the most gratifying moment for me as a New York City cop um, and you know that that's the case that'll just always have my heart. Precinct. It was mid-afternoon. We got a call from family members looking for their family. They had tried to call them several times within the last few days, and they didn't get any response. They then went over to the house, and they didn't get any response at the door, which was very strange to them because they said, you know, that the, that the parents were basically homebodies at that point. So they came to the police for assistance. Come in quick. Something definitely. They went over to the house with, with the police, and the police didn't get any response. They forced their way into the basement of the house, where they found a female victim who was apparently shot four or five times on the couch that uh, was down in the basement. They then told the family members to stay outside. They then started searching the house, and they found additional victims upstairs. The other victims they found were the parents who were in their bedroom, in their bed, shot several times themselves. And in the other bedroom, there was Yo, we got two more in here. a male with a female, who they didn't know at that time, who was also shot and killed in that bedroom. So there's a total of five people that were killed in this house. So they, they called us, we responded to the scene. And at that point, it was just total chaos out in front of the place. I mean, there was more police cars there. I don't know how news reporters got wind of this already, but they were responding to the scene and everything else. And at, at this point, you don't know what direction to go with this. It didn't appear to be like a home invasion robbery or anything else that they were involved in. The doors were locked, the house was secured, there was no broken windows, so you know, who got in here to kill these people? It was then told to us that there was a grandson uh, living there who was a 17 or 18 year old fellow. He wasn't there though when we searched the house. Well, where was this person? From what we can gather from these people who really didn't have a good relationship with this kid was that he comes and goes and, and wherever he pleases and that he's a very quiet kid and I don't know where he is. This 17 year old was the only one left alive in this family so naturally we wanted to speak with him to find out if, in fact, he was there when this happened, or if he had knowledge about this, or, or anything else. In doing a canvas in the area over there, we were able to find out from one of the neighbors that the following morning, 
late in the afternoon, I would say about 1 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they saw him leaving the house, get into a cab, and leave with a suitcase. We were able to find out he had a girlfriend. We contacted her, and we uh, had her come into the precinct. Well, this where he is. She said that she had spoken to him a few days prior and that he had told her that he was going up to the Rochester area up in New York and that uh, he would be up there for some time because he was doing some business up there, meaning that she knew that he was involved in dealing drugs, but on a small type of level. He had a house that she knew or a contact number that she knew that she could call to reach him. And this was a cell phone or, or a phone number to somebody else that uh, you know could reach out and get to him, a friend of his up there. And she was able to contact this person. She spoke to this and she said, yeah, I saw what she would refer to as Junebug, that was his nickname. He was up here a few days now and, and I'll try to get a hold of him. The person who she spoke to was able to find him and brought him back to the house and he called her, the girlfriend, from that house. We were there listening to the conversation. I'm worried, I don't want to know where you are. And basically, he gave her a statement over the phone that he broke down and that he had killed his parents, his cousin, and it was his cousin's girlfriend that was the female victim, and the other cousin, the younger one downstairs in the basement, that he couldn't take it anymore, that he was sick and tired of them not treating him right, not giving him things that he wanted, and basically that you know he felt like he was an outsider there. That he didn't feel like there was any love in that house and that he couldn't take it anymore. So he decided to come home. He knew that his cousin left a gun in the safe because he was a drug dealer himself. And he took the gun out. He had the weapon up with him. It was up in Rochester that he had taken a bus up there. With this information, we had contacted the Rochester police. I spoke to a detective up there, and I gave him all this information that we wanted to find this fellow and that if you can find them for us, we would come up there and get a full statement from him and probably charge him with the murder of, of, his, of his relatives. He told me to send a photo up there of him. So the next morning I get to work and I, I call this detective. It's about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. He said, yeah, uh, you know, I, I got the photo of and I'm looking through it now and I'll reach out to the people who I know that, you know, he knows. And he said, but I can't do it right now because we just got a shooting ourselves, and it's a shooting of three people. I have to go out on that, and I'll get back to you later on today. So this detective, along with his fellow detectives, went out to this crime scene where they had three people originally thought were just shot. Well, it turns out there was three people murdered inside a house that was very familiar to them as a drug location. This young fellow went in there, and he shot three people, one in the basement and two upstairs. And right after the shooting happened, another female came to the house to buy some drugs. This suspect confronted her, but didn't do anything to her. And she saw the bodies laying on the living room, and he just walked out. So when the detectives got there, they interviewed her, and she said, I know him as to be Junebug. Junebug? Yeah, Junebug. How long have you known him? Well, this detective looks around, and he says, wait a second. He goes, I just spoke to a guy from New York City about a guy named Junebug. How many Junebugs could there be? He takes out this photo that I sent him. This is the guy? Yeah, that's Junebug. He says, this is the guy that killed these three people? She says, this is the guy that when I walked into this home, he was standing here with a gun in his hand, and there was people laying on the, on, on the floor. So they called me back, and he says, you're not going to believe this. He says, but apparently your fella shot and killed three other people up here. And now we're looking for him for the same thing. So I think it was uh, like a day or two later, through informants that they had, they were able to find out that he was hiding in the basement of a church up in that area. They went into this church along with the, the pastor of this church, and he was sleeping in the basement of this church, and they apprehended him. This young fellow who was 17, 18, was responsible for killing eight people. You know, I remember coming back with him on the plane and he just sat there, just staring into space. Basically, when we got back to the precinct, he just looked at me and he said, I just needed to do it because they didn't show me any love. I was assigned to this special victim squad in Queens. 
on one particular night, we received the case of a woman who was sleeping in her bed, and somebody broke into a house and raped her. by the patrol officers that this occurred. One team of detectives went to the hospital to interview her and gather the f information on, on what occurred. And myself and two other detectives went to the scene to gather evidence. The woman lived in a three-story garden apartment complex in uh, Fresh Meadows, Queens. The crime scene unit came to the residence and uh, we noted that the subject had entered the house by cutting the screen in the kitchen and climbing in through the window. Fingerprints were recovered from the apartment. Looking at the crime scene, you could see that the jewelry box was emptied out. Uh, the drawers had been gone through. There was apparently a computer missing from the, from the computer desk. The following morning, we did an extensive canvas of the neighborhood, and we found no witnesses to anyone lingering around the area or entering or exiting the house. According to the detectives at the hospital, the woman also indicated that she had a camera on, the, on her night table and that the uh, subject picked up this camera and had taken several photographs of her naked on her bed. We then went through her jewelry box and removed jewelry and took her computer as well and exited out the front door. The day following the rape, my partner and I went back to the area where this occurred and we started canvassing and speaking to, to witnesses. There was this really creepy guy who's been walking around the neighborhood. He walks around at night usually, and he's just been peeping in people's windows. You know, being that we had nothing else to go on, we convinced one of these people, if they would come with us the following night, to sit in an observation van with us and try and identify who this person was. They said they didn't know who he was, but they, they knew him by sight. The following night, we'd set up about 10 o'clock at night, and we knew we were going to be there for a couple of hours. So we had sodas, potato chips, cheese doodles. We just needed to keep this witness with us for as long as possible to, uh, to try and identify the Peeping Tom. Within 30 seconds of us sitting there, we just opened up our soda, and along came the Peeping Tom. That's him right you there, sure? that guy. Yeah. You sure that's him? That, that guy right there. That's him. So my partner and I got out of the van. We approached the man who, who was very nervous, and um, we told him there was a crime that was committed in the area and that we needed to talk to him to see if he was a witness to anything. As we were talking to him, he kept looking back at the window of the woman who was, who was sexually assaulted. So we knew something was up. Once we got to the precinct, uh, we sat him down in our interrogation room, and we got some soda, we got some donuts and pizza, and we sat talking for almost two hours. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get any information from him about the crime, other than he does walk around the neighborhood, he does live in the area, and that he does, was in the area at the time of, of the crime. It was about 11.30 at night, and I called the victim up on the phone. And during our conversation, I explained that I had a suspect and I would like her to come down and view a lineup. At that point, she cut me off in mid-sentence and said, Detective, I can't view a lineup. I cannot identify this man. And I said to her, well, I've been doing this a long time. I've had many, many cases. And you may not be able to identify him, but maybe from his stature or, or the sound of his voice or just his physique. And she cut me off again and she said, you're not listening to me. I'm telling you, I can't identify anybody because I'm blind. So I, I looked out at the complaint report and all the interview reports, and nowhere does it say that she's blind. I go, well, what do you mean? You're, you're colored blind? Are you, you just you see shadows? She goes, I'm blind. I'm legally blind. So perplexed, I stood there for a few minutes, and I said, OK, I'll call you back in a few minutes. And I hung the phone up, and it's, it's like 12.30 at night at this point, and I decided to call my partner, who did the interview up. And he picked the phone up, and I said, Vito, is there something you forgot to tell me on the interview? And he says, no, everything's there. Everything's in the case. Folder's there. You know, it's all up to date. And I said, did you forget to tell me that she was blind? And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I forgot about that. I'm like, did you think that was important? We both knew we had a big problem here because m most cases are made in court on eyewitness identification, and there was no way of getting an eyewitness identification in a case where you have a victim that's blind. So we, we knew we had to go above and beyond to try and get some evidence to convict this guy because this, this was a real problem. We had called the fingerprint section to see if they could identify the subject's prints with the prints that were obtained inside the apartment, but they weren't available. It was 11.30, 12 o'clock at night. They were not available to do that until the following day. So we devised a plan. 
He had been drinking a can of soda in there. We removed the can with a pair of tweezers right in front of him for his benefit, and we left him in the interview room. Now, neither m myself or nor my partner knew anything about fingerprints, so we ended up getting a fingerprint kit, and we just covered the Coke can with fingerprint powder. We then uh, took a, a print card, and I took my own fingerprint, my own thumbprint, put it on the print card, went to the photocopy machine and blew it up two times. I took a uh, VCR tape, I put a piece of masking tape over it, and I wrote video surveillance on it. We put that in a box along with the Coke can and along with a Bible that we had found in the office and a few other pieces of paper. And we walked in and I put the box down right in front of him. And I took everything out and put it on the table in front of him. And he didn't, he was beside himself. He didn't know what was going on. I said, see these two fingerprints? And they were obviously blown up on a large piece of paper. I said, do they look the same? And he said, absolutely, as he studied them. I said, this print is from that Coke can that was covered with the powder. This print is from the kitchen of the woman that was assaulted. And he looked at that and I said, here's a surveillance tape. I said to him, obviously there's a problem here and you have to explain what's going on. I said, the good part is the woman does not want to press charges. If she gets a computer back, she's willing to forget the whole thing. When interviewing a person like that and trying to elicit a confession, we often uh, bend the truth a lot. And basically we put the person at ease de-escalate the crime to make them feel that this wasn't really a big deal. So he seemed a little bit relieved, and he, he thought about it for a while. I said, I have enough evidence here to convict you. It's, it's your choice now. He looked over at the Bible and looked up at us, and he said, yes, that he had been in her apartment, that he was sorry, and he'd never done anything like this before. So I took, we took a pad of paper out, and we gave him a pen, and we told him to accurately describe exactly what happened that night at which time he wrote out a hand confession. And when he wrote down what occurred, he said that he had seen the woman often around the neighborhood and smiled at her and he thought she was nice and that uh, you know he, he wanted to meet her was, was his version of what happened. Of course, that's not true because if you want to meet somebody, you ring their doorbell, you don't climb in through their, their kitchen window. Uh, after he wrote out the confession, he kept saying that he was really sorry for this. And I said, if you're truly sorry, why don't you indicate that as well? And he then wrote a letter of apology to both the woman and the judge that he was going to have to see. The next day, uh, we did a search warrant in the uh, subject's house, and we in fact recovered the jewelry, the computer, the camera, and other items that were missing from the woman's house. A day and a half later, we were still processing everything, and uh, a uniformed police officer was asked to speak to me. And uh, he says, listen, I have a problem. I got to ask you something. I said, well, what do you need? What's the problem? He says, ah, it was my sister was, was engaged to this guy, and he got arrested, and, you know, maybe you can just explain something to me. He's a really nice guy. He really didn't do anything wrong. He says this is all a misunderstanding. I'm like, well, who's the guy? And it turns out it was the person who was the subject of, of this, this rape case that confessed to me. So he says, uh, you know, she really loves him. She thinks he's a nice guy. So I said, well, let me explain something to you. I took him into the back room. I showed him the written confession. I showed him the, the videotape confession. I showed him the property that was removed from his house that was the woman's property. And I, uh, I said, this, this is really not a misunderstanding. If he wanted to meet this woman like he's telling your sister and like he first told us, he would have rang the doorbell and spoke to her. He climbed in through the window. He broke the window, cut the screen and forcibly raped the woman and removed this property from the house. So he looked at me and said, okay, no problem, turned around and walked out. <laughs> Never saw him again. When, when the subject went to arraignment, he was deeply remorseful of what happened. He really thought he was gonna get away with it because he thought the woman was not gonna testify and she really was gonna drop the charges when she got her property back. So at the, uh, the time of the first hearing, uh, he decided not to go to trial, and he pled guilty. And uh, because of that, the defense attorney and the subject never found out that the woman was blind. And to this date, he still doesn't know after he served his, his seven and a half years in jail. I'm in the office, uh, and we get a call, we got a homicide. It's on the street, we used to call Snake Hill growing up in the Bronx, because it was a very windy street. Went from the Bedford Park area over to Riverdale. It's in a residence. I get up to the scene. Crime scene's roped off. We have about a 60-year-old woman in the kitchen. 
stabbed to death numerous times. Blood all over the place. The knife apparently right out of the butcher block in the kitchen. At the scene, the, the husband shows up. He had he'd gotten off of work. The husband was a doctor, uh, originally from South America. And, and he's totally doesn't know what's going on. You can just imagine, he comes home from work, there's crime scene tape, there's police cars and all kinds of detectives and stuff in and out of his house. We have to break the bad news that, that his wife had been killed. And he informs us that there were some uh, Mexican workers uh, at the house doing some home improvements and that his wife had gotten into an argument just the day before with one of them. She had thought that he stole something from the house. Idiot. So our original thought was maybe this guy that got fired had come back, or there was some type of dispute. Now the son shows up, and we have to tell him what happened. Oh my God, no, is she okay? She's gone. Multiple. What? And he breaks down. <laughs> He's, you know, and you could tell he's kind of a little like mama boyish to begin with. He's like a little bit nerdy. He's not, you know, you could tell right away. And we had asked him when the last time he saw his mother, and he was like, he hadn't been there since yesterday. They were planning his wedding. And we, we console him. We track down some of the Mexican workers, but we can't track down the one that had been fired. They're saying that the son, had come over the house, and the mother had asked them to leave and go home. And that's they weren't going to argue with her because she was very stern. Uh, she, she treated them very poorly all the time. And she had accused their friend of stealing something, and he didn't take anything. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Just, she's crazy, man. Oh, uh, did she come outside and she gives you guys a hard time? So we had kind of told him, you're covering for your friend. Your friend came back. He got into an argument again with her. He, he was taken out, and their story was all the same. We go in to talk to the son, and the, the son is telling us, you know, he loves his mother very much, and this should be the happiest time of his life. He's getting married. Well, in the course of talking to the son, another team had tracked down the Mexican worker that had gotten fired, and we start talking to him. Get now! The, the woman was a tyrant. He had never gone back to the house. So we go back at the son because the, 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 the workers had told us that the son was there that day, and we confront him with his lie that he hadn't seen his mother from the day before. Well, he says he was, he was so upset that he got confused and he wasn't sure when he, you know, he saw his mother last. But now we're, we're really zeroing in on him because he seems like he, he's lying to us. We go out and we find his fiance and we start talking to her. I want to thank you for meeting us today here. Got a few questions we want to ask you about your fiance. She tells us that her future mother-in-law is just horrible. She's a real bitch. Okay, so there were a lot of different options for flowers, but I think what we finally decided is that that something simple, uh -huh. really classic. Um, She's just so controlling, and nothing's right unless it's her decision. Nobody else can make a right decision unless it's her. She took these wedding plans and turned them into everything was going to be her decision. And she had started off, no, you, you, you kids do whatever you want, and she just turned into a controlling, controlling woman. These flowers are really going to make a statement. That is no way to run a wedding. These are all handmade dessert. What do you think? So now we go back to the sun and we tell him, listen, we talked to your fiance, and we know that you had a big problem with your mother. I love my mother. I, I... He just started talking to us, and he's telling us, you know, this is the happiest time of my life, and he was in denial. I would never be a part of something that hurt her. And he went from, I love my mother very, very much, to, no, I couldn't have possibly did that to my mother. No, 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 don't say it. No, I couldn't have did that, and he's going on. Tell me everything. Just start from the beginning. All right, this is how it happened. This is how I did it. He says, you know, my whole life, my mother, just constantly, constantly, there was nothing ever good enough. My, your father's a doctor, and you're going to be nothing. And, and when I went to school, my grades were never good enough. And, you know, I wasn't good enough to be her son. And constantly, over the years, well, now I meet this girl, and, and my mother finally acknowledges that this girl's a nice girl. 
But it was all a ruse, because as soon as we started to make the wedding plans, here I am, engaged, getting married, and she just took over all the wedding plans. She just took over everything, and then she started talking bad about my fiance. She's no good, she's probably a slut, and this is going on and on. Well, I go to my mother's house today, and I'm gonna set her straight and tell her, listen, we wanna plan our own wedding. Well, we get into this argument. And she pulls out a knife out of the thing and says, you're not my son. I, you know, I gave you life, I should take your life. And she came at me with the knife. I grabbed the knife from her and I just, I, I just, the next thing I know. She was on the floor, there was blood everywhere. I just dropped the knife and I left. I got out of there, I got rid of all the bloody clothes, and I just felt such a relief after I killed her that all this weight was off my shoulders because of how long she tortured me. This poor kid, he winds up getting 20 to life, and in all my years of homicide, I never felt bad for somebody who killed somebody, never mind somebody who killed his mother. But if there was one person I felt bad for, was this kid, because you could see the abuse that this kid had through his whole life. Now, it's not right, you don't kill anybody, but I never felt so bad locking somebody up in my life like I did for this poor kid. The guy, I guess from bleeding, he goes down. I pick up a vase and I hit him over the head with the vase. He said, Flex just started stabbing him and keep stabbing him, stabbing him. What is this guy, an idiot? You know, you just killed four people. You, you think that the, co the police aren't gonna find out that you did it? I took the socket wrench, I beat her over the head. Then I went, my mother was yelling for me, I went and I fed her. Yeah, Bob. The brother comes out of the back, and I was shocked, along with the uh, Suffolk County detectives, because they couldn't believe it either. He looks just like Santa Claus. <laughs> I work in a day tour out of the homicide squad. We got a call from nine priests and detectives that, that they had a possible homicide on the Lower East Side. The radio call guys get a, a radio call for uh, calls for help in this apartment building on the Lower East Side. They get over there, they don't know who called 911 at that point, and uh, they start doing a search of the building where the address was given. And they don't see anything. So the cops were smart. They took it upon themselves to uh, go up the fire escape in the front of the house and uh, see if they could look into the windows. Sure enough, they get to the second floor and they uh, look into the window and they see a, a bloody mess crime scene uh, in this apartment on the second floor. Have a bus respond, mail down, mail down, Central. So the cops, uh, then, they, you know, they come down, they break into the apartment that they figure out which apartment it is, and uh, there's a guy in the bathroom, inside the bathroom, halfway into the uh, living room area, uh, stabbed to death. So we get the call from the ninth precinct detectives to go over and uh, assist them on this homicide. What apartment? Second floor, two city. Yeah, thanks. So when we show up, you know, I've seen a lot of homicides and a lot of crime scenes. This is probably one of the most brutal uh, murders I've seen. This guy was hacked up, I mean, bad. Place was a mess, it looked like there was a huge fight, uh, broken glass everywhere, there was a broken vase, it, it was just a real mess. Turns out this guy, uh, you know, is a drug dealer. So right away we start thinking motive, maybe it was a robbery, but at the same time, we're looking at the, you know, the violence and the homicide, how bad it was, and saying, these guys had to know. Well, this guy, whoever, we didn't know how many people did this homicide. We do a canvas and, uh, Got a little uh, little leeway with one of the kids in the neighborhood who said, you know, the guy that knows the guy that got killed, he was hanging out on the corner, and uh, he had a bandage on his hand like he got cut. So, you know, what's his name? He didn't know his name, but he told us his nickname. He said his nickname was Flex. All right, so now we start running the name Flex in the computer. And we come up with a guy's name, 
and a couple yeah. of addresses okay. that he used when he was arrested. Plus, we run all the names of the guys he was arrested with. That's him. We go out to look for the guy. So now we go to the mother's house. He's not around. We go to the girlfriend's house that he was living with. He's not around there. This guy Flex apparently found out we were looking for him, so he comes walking into the station house. We start to interview him, bring him in, and goes, you know, what am, you know, who are you guys looking for us? So I give him the old story of, yeah, we, you know, this guy got murdered. We understand you might know him. We're just seeing if you could help us out. You know, I give him the old help us out routine, see if he can uh, at least talk to us. So I asked him to get in, you know, let me ask you something. When's the last time you saw this guy? He's like, oh, I haven't seen him in a long time. It's been years. He says, you know anything about him dealing drugs? He's like, uh, I heard that he was dealing drugs, but I don't know anything about that. So he, dan he danced around everything. Comes to the point, I asked him how he cut his hand. And, uh, he says to me, well, I was helping some homeless guy up on 14th Street move some bags, and he had glass in it, and, and it cut my hand. I said, ah, oh, that's, that's too bad. I said, you mind if I see it? He says, nah, it's all bandaged up, I can't. Well, how many stitches did you get? So I got like 25 stitches. I'm like, man, that's a lot of stitches. So I said, all right. I gotta tell you, your story sounds a little fishy to me. You know, I'm not really comfortable with what you're telling me. I, yeah, I think you might know a little bit more than what you're telling me. Oh, no, 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 no. So why don't you show me where the garbage can is with its glasses? And we, you know, if I see the blood on the glasses, that'll be it. So we take them in the car, we drive around with them, we go to 14th Street. Ain't no garbage can, ain't no bag, nothing. Nothing's around. So now, I, you know, I lay into them a little bit more. I said, you know, listen, don't both me. Don't give me the story that this, that, what, what, what happened with your hand? So now I'm telling you, I said, all right, come with me. We're going to go to the hospital. I want to take a look at it. So we go over to Cabrini Hospital, and I have the physician assistant unwrap the hand. And sure enough, it's a straight cut like it came from a knife. We wrap it back up. We take him back to the station house. So now we lay into him. I said, listen, you don't, you know, don't lie, because now we got nothing yet. We have no forensics yet. We have no witnesses. Um, so we really don't have nothing other than what this guy's telling us. Now I get a little nervous because now he's starting to give me that. And if you, when you're doing this a while, you kind of get that sense when somebody's ready to tell you, you know, I want a lawyer. And we don't want that, so uh, we had to let him go. We let him go, and now we get a blood print in the vase uh, at the scene. Comes back to a guy named Ali, who's from the neighborhood, and what we learned from the computer checks that he ran with this guy, Flex. So now we got his photo. We go out in the street, we're looking for him, we, we pick him up. One of the detectives sees him on the street, we pick him up, we bring him in. The first detective's talking to him, uh, you know, they get into a whole thing with him. They got him in the guy's apartment saying that, yeah, I used to go up there, smoke pot with the guy. I used to clean the apartment for him. He used to pay me to clean the apartment. A, a, a real cock and bull story. We give him a little bit of time, then we go in and we hit him with it. Listen, your fingerprint, your blood print is in the apartment on a vase. The guy's dead, so stop the games. What, what's going on here? Sure enough, he gives up the whole case. He says him and this guy Flex uh, decided to go rob him because they knew he always had money and uh, drugs in the place. He says the guy, I guess from bleeding, he goes down. I pick up a vase and I hit him over the head with the vase. He said Flex just started stabbing him and keep stabbing him, stabbing him. So he says we grabbed uh, some uh, some of the stash he had there, the drugs he had, and some cash, which wasn't a lot, maybe $1,200. He gives us the whole story. Now we go back out looking for Flex. Go back to the mother's house, go to uh, the girlfriend's house, nobody's seen him. When I'm at the mother's house, my partner Billy's talking to the mother, and I kind of give him that look, like, let me take a look at the phone. I see a couple of numbers. You know, she has that call log on the phone where you can read what number's called, so I start writing down the phone numbers. Sure enough, we get a, uh, we get a, a number that matches uh, his same last name, so we're thinking maybe it's a relative, so it turns out it's his cousin. It's an apartment in the Lower East Side, so we go to the apartment. It's a duplex apartment. Knock on the door. <laughs> We walk out, we leave. A day or two later, we're working the case, still looking for him, looking for him. We get a phone call, comes an anonymous phone call that uh, he's held up at his cousin's house, the house we were at. 
We'll go back there with four of us now, so we're knocking on the door. Who is it? It's Detective DeSharvey. Remember we spoke the other day? I just need to talk to you real quick. What do you want? Get out of here. I have nothing to say to you. He says, I'm gonna get my dog. Next thing you know, he gets this dog. And we he starts going nuts, the dog. And he's open, you know, he's hitting the door. You can hear him trying to get through the door, the dog. So we're like, listen, get rid of that dog. We just want to talk to you for a few minutes. Take it easy, just put the dog away. No, nah, I'm letting the dog loose. I'm letting the dog loose. Now here's four detectives in our pants, like, oh my god, you know, backing up with our guns drawn, ready to shoot this dog. He's looking to tear us all apart. So we're screaming at the guy, put the dog away. We just want to talk to you, put the dog away. This goes on for a couple of minutes, but it seemed like an eternity. Now, if he let that dog go, we're gonna, we're gonna have to shoot him. And we didn't want to take that chance, because we didn't know if there was kids in the apartment, and you know, you don't want to let a couple of stray bullets hit somebody that didn't deserve it. Because these dogs are notorious. You shoot them in the head, it bounces off their skull, and the bullet goes flying. So we didn't want that to happen. We turn around, we get, we get him to pull the dog in, and he makes the mistake of sticking his head out. So I grab him by the head, and I pull him out. I got him on the ground, the three, four of us got him on the ground, we're trying to get him handcuffed, and he's got the leash on one end, the dog's on the other side of the door, and you know, kind of telling him, listen, what are, you, what are you doing? How stupid could you be? We're gonna kill your dog, and now you're going to jail for, uh, you know, trying to kill us. He says, ah, oh, you know, I says, where's your cousin? He says, where's your cousin? Stop, stop the baloney, where is he? He says, ah, oh, he's in the apartment. I said, well, tell him to come down. Flex, Flex, you gotta come out. It's done, man. Listen to me, put the dog in the bathroom and just come out. They know you're in there. Flex finally comes to the door. We pull him out, we handcuff him, and that was it. We take him back to the station house. We tell him what we got, all the evidence we got against him. We let him know, you know, you're done. Just tell us what happened. So he goes into the whole story that he went up there to, to rob the guy. But then he starts saying, I, I, I didn't mean to stab him that many times. I'm looking at the ME and I'm saying, these. These are post-mortem wounds here. He says, yeah, they are. There's about 10 or, 10 or 12 of them. So you knew there was a lot of passion behind this whole murder. So at the end of this case, we wind up, uh, we went to a hearing, and it was, it was such overwhelming evidence against both, against both these guys that uh, they take a plea to 15 uh, to life. So I'm probably never going to see them again. And I hope to God I never see that dog ever again in my life. I was in the police department approximately 15 years at the time. I've been to a lot of crime scenes, but uh, this one was probably one of the worst I've ever seen. Working a four to one, about 11 o'clock, job came over, shots fired, multiple people shot. First they had said that it was a robbery. As I get there, they're actually dragging one of the victims out, a survivor. He's on his way to the hospital. He's telling me he's, he's not gonna make it. He's he got multiple gunshot wounds all over him. They tell me to go into the back. That's where most of the scene is. In the back room, there is a huge stainless steel walk-in refrigerator. Laid down on the floor is four bodies. Working four to one, about 11 o'clock. Job came over, shots fired. They tell me to go into the back. That's where most of the scene is. In the back room, there is a huge stainless steel walk-in refrigerator. Laid down on the floor is four bodies. Shot multiple times. Shell casings everywhere. The only witness that we had saw a bunch of kids coming out of this bodega carrying a safe. He said, it looks like the safe was way too heavy for them because they dropped it. In fact, when they dropped it, I, th I think he said it dropped on one of the kid's ankles. The surviving witness, he got shot five or six times. You know, you're thinking, this is it. If he goes, investigation's over. And uh, when we found out that uh, he was going to make us, because a lot of them went in and out, the bullets, it was like, this is great. We're going to be able to talk to this guy. He's going to tell us everything. He'll be able to put all the pieces to the puzzle together. And he tells us a story where he's in the basement of his bodega, and he hears noise down there. What the hell? What are you doing here? I'm trying to get some sleep, man. You can't sleep here. Get the hell out of here. And the kid leaves. Uh, he's gone for maybe five or 10 minutes. Next thing he knows, there's this kid 
coming in with three other people. I believe they thought it was a Dominican numbers bodega, so they, they expected to have a lot of money in there, which they didn't have a lot. And the guy he had seen in the basement that he knew from the neighborhood says to the guy with the Uzi, hey, listen, he saw my face. He, he knows who I am. And the guy with the Uzi hands him the Uzi and says, well, you know what? You do what you got to do. Come on, man. Come on, man. Hurry up. Take care of business, man. Let's go. The next thing he heard was they opened fire. He said he was laying behind his brother. His brother took most of the uh, bullets. And that's how he thinks he survived. I got a hold of our MiraQuick unit, which is a unit that carries only photos of people that have been arrested. Right. They were able to go over to the hospital, right. show him pictures of people from the area. And at that time, he had pointed somebody out, saying, this is the kid that I saw in the basement. I had left the office. It was, it was probably after midnight. At that time, I received a call from one of the detectives saying that, listen, the perp you're looking for just walked into the precinct. Hey. He came in because his girlfriend had gotten locked up for robbery, and he wanted to bring her a coat. So while he was waiting to give her a coat, the detective that was upstairs, he gets notified of a robbery arrest. He goes downstairs, and since this picture was on his desk, he's like, oh my god, this is the same guy that you know, Mike's looking for. What is this guy, an idiot? You know, you just killed four people. You, you think that the, co the police aren't going to find out that you did it? Look, I want to know what's going on. By the time I got back to the precinct, we uh, sat him down, okay, told him what we were wait. looking for, read him his rights. He gave us a complete description of what happened. Such a heinous crime and one of the easiest confessions we got. From the time that he came into the precinct at midnight till Probably midnight the next day, the case was done. You think that just everything is good in the world, you're great, you, you solve this quadruple homicide, you're getting the pats on the back, and then everything goes down the drain. The guy that we caught in the Bronx, he pled right out, I think, for 25 years. The guy that actually bought in the Uzi, he got convicted of 150 years to life. The guy that actually was hiding in the basement that actually did all the shooting, he got acquitted of all charges by the uh, the jury. I was pissed. I mean, you know, you, you're mad. You're like, how can two guys get convicted and the guy that actually did the shooting and, and the, the victim saying, that's the guy that shot us, he got off. You know, you talk to the family and say, I, you know, I don't know what happened. So I got some bad news for you. The verdict just wasn't right. It wasn't the right thing. And uh, sat down with the district attorney and said, there's got to be something else we could do. The, you know, four people are killed here. We got to get this is this is eating at you, you know, it eats at your stomach. That it's it's bad. We got to do something about it. I spoke to a couple of U.S. attorneys, and they came up with uh, Hobbs Act robbery, where you you, you just to go into a, a, any any place and do a robbery with it where there's weapons involved. Uh, that, that's a crime. The guy that cooperated, he tells us that you know not for nothing, but the guy that went in to the bodega originally, went in with a gun. The DA came out and said, you know, go to that bodega. Maybe that gun is still there. I went down and went to the bodega, went down into the basement where he was, and in this, in this back room where the boiler room was, there was the gun on top of a, uh, a shelf with a piece of cardboard still with dust all over it that he had hidden up there. I said, oh, this is it. This is, this is all we need. This is proven that he went in there. And we talked to the US attorney we get him indicted again on, on robbery charges. Running him, I ended up coming up with uh, an address possibly in, in Georgia. It just so happens that he uh, wanted to get a good guy letter from the Atlanta Police Department and decided that he was gonna walk into a precinct again and ask them, you know, I've been, I've been down in, in Georgia here now for six months or seven months, whatever the case may be. Can I get a letter saying that I've been good because I'm trying to get a job? So at that time, the Atlantic Police Department, they run his name, and he comes up with a warrant. And the feds went down, picked him up, 
and we retried him. Here's a kid that had the arrogance to walk into a precinct not just once after killing four people, but twice. And both times he was arrested for the same act. He's just arrogant, I guess. You know, well, is it stupidity? I don't know. Maybe it's stupidity. He got 150 years to life, and if he lives more than 150 years, maybe he'll get out. But I doubt it. Getting late in the afternoon towards the end of our tour, when we receive a call from uh, the desk sergeant downstairs saying a patrol had just found a box with a body in it down on 11th Avenue and 66th Street. We know we got something serious, so we all go down there, myself and two or three of my partners. Sure enough, we get to the scene, and uh, there's this plywood box lying on the sidewalk. We speak to the two gentlemen who found the box. They work in the apartment complex surrounding the area. Hi, from the top, what happened? We work around here and we see the box. We took the nails out there, we popped it open, and then we opened it, it was a, was a body in there. It was a dead body in there. When they opened it up, they found the body covered in quilts, called 9-11. It shocked us to find that this body had been sitting here on a sidewalk in a box in a Lincoln Center neighborhood, and nobody bothered to call in about it. We start canvassing right away. And a couple of them had said, yeah, we've seen it here for a few days. We didn't know how it got there or anything like that. So at this point, we've got nothing. We don't know who the victim is or what happened. The ME calls us a few days later, says the cause of death was asphyxiation and that there was a lot of blunt trauma to the body, to the head especially. So we're spending our, our days and nights now canvassing this large apartment complex. And that's not coming up with anything. We're handing out flyers to all the people on the buses that go by. Nothing. Our captain looks at the clothing photos that we'd had. He says, you know, that's a pretty unusual blouse. Let's put it on TV. Within half an hour after that being on TV, a gentleman calls up and says, I recognize whose clothes those are. And he tells us, it's a woman who works at the Metropolitan Opera over in Lincoln Center. And he tells us where she lived and that as far as he knew, she had been in Florida visiting a sick aunt. Go over to the apartment that night. What can I do for you? We'd like to ask you a few questions. They interviewed this gentleman who's in the apartment, he's probably about 65 years old. Turns out he's the victim's brother. Two, three weeks ago, she went to Florida to take care of my aunt. Well, we have some sad news for you. The sister was killed. She was murdered. Sure it was my sister? Sir, look, I got a sick mother in the back that I got to see too. Excuse me. And he's not, he's just not talking. And, and they find it weird. He's living in this apartment now, and there's an elderly woman, his uh -huh. mother, bedridden, also in the apartment. Uh huh? How you doing? We get in touch with another family member who's living in Paris, and she gives us a little background on him. His wife at the time had passed away. Never had a steady job, but he was always going from one scheme to another to make money. Ladies, I've got something special to show you. He uh, ran some kind of costume jewelry scam. He was trying to sell it on the sidewalk. It's old gold. They don't make gold like this anymore. He would lived off his wife's income for a long time when, when they had married, what have you. Bring him up. So we bring him to the station house, and he's in the interview room all night long. And there was something about this guy. He was just very monotone. He wasn't saying a lot, and what he did say wasn't really being helpful. He'd just sit there, and, and in a long time, he just denied knowing what happened to his sister. Look at us when we're talking to you. Don't turn away. Then late in the morning, or well, late in the night, and early in the next morning, he says to us, All right, I tell you what. You give me a large diet soda, I'll tell you what you want to know. Okay. Now, we're looking at this guy. He wears a colostomy bag. And we give him his diet soda, and he starts drinking it down. He says, Okay, here's what happened. 
I had a fight with my sister. <laughs> I can't take this anymore. I'm in there taking care of mom. You're sitting in there watching television? She wanted me out of the apartment because I didn't contribute anything. She went down to take care of our aunt. And when she came back, she wanted me gone. When she came back, I waited for her inside the vestibule. I took this socket wrench, I beat her over the head. Then I went, my mother was yelling for me, I went and I fed her. Yeah, Ma. Then I went back and I couldn't bear to look at my sister's face there on the floor. So I took a plastic bag and wrapped it over her face. And that is what actually killed her. She suffocated. So now he's sitting there saying to himself, I have to get rid of this body. He walked down to West 43rd Street to a lumber yard. Now, he's up, he's up in the 70s now somewhere. Walks down there with a hand cart, has the dimensions for the plywood box that he wants to build. Gets the wood, walks all the way back. Builds this box, puts her in it, covers her with quilts, etc. And he walks it from where he's living on 72nd Street down to 66th and 11th. And we couldn't believe that he could do it because he was a frail guy with this colostomy bag on him, but he did. As cool as can be, he said, that's what happened. And, you know, I did it. He showed no remorse whatsoever. He was just like cold. One of the veteran homicide detectives said it was one of the coldest guys he'd ever seen. Ended up going to trial. Got convicted to life, died in prison about three or four years later. It was a shame that, you know, here's, here's this woman taking care of two elderly people, and this guy kills her because he's afraid of doing something for himself, getting a job, for instance. One night I was working in the 81st Precinct in the Bedford-Stuyvesant area of Brooklyn. I get a call from the, a female who tells me that uh, she has information on the homicide. She says that she's in the deli and uh, she hears a gunshot. And she looks out and she sees this man pushing something out of the passenger side of the car onto the ground. The man closes the door and he took off in his, his cab and he left. And when that person took off, she got a little bit closer and noticed that it was a body on the ground. Now, the man doesn't see her, but she sees him, enough to see what he looks like, to give us a description. I think the guy who might have did this looks like uh, Santa Claus. And I said, what do you mean Santa Claus? And she said, yeah, he looked just like Santa. A jolly guy with a belly. He had a long beard, suspenders. He looked just like Santa Claus, Chris Kringle. It's gonna be kind of hard <laughs> in this neighborhood to find out who Santa Claus is because this is a predominantly black neighborhood. So of course, we didn't believe him. My partners and I, we go out to the scene, which is on Atlantic Avenue, and the uh, uniform officers, when we arrive, have the area cordon off with tape. There's a, uh, a body face down, there's blood on the ground. When I approached the, the victim and looked at the victim, who was a male black, I looked at the identification that he had on him. We ran his criminal record, his criminal history, and we found out that he had been arrested numerous times. The uniform uh, cops informed us there was nobody around. After we spoke with them and took pictures, we decided that we had to do a canvas. We go out and knock on door to door. We start speaking to people in the neighborhood uh, and ask them if they saw or heard anything. The canvas that we did didn't really turn up anything. Uh, the people that we spoke to, no one could tell us anything, no one saw anything, uh, didn't know. Uh, anything about it, didn't hear anything about it. So this woman was really our only clue to help us. I took her information and uh, I went back to the precinct with my partners and we tried to figure out and put this thing together as to what happened. So we started calling around and we really got nowhere with anything, all our phone calls to all the car services in the area. Uh, maybe he was a cab driver from not the Bedford Stuyvesant area, but maybe uh, the south part of Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, in the south part of Brooklyn, nothing. Nobody could give us any information. So the cab services said they had nobody that fit the description of Santa Claus. That worked for them. In the precinct, the uniform cops, came, one of them came upstairs to us and told us that there was a fight uh, in the area with some kids yesterday. And some kids had traveled from uh, Long Island to Brooklyn to attend a party. And uh, the officer also told us that some of the kids took cabs out from Long Island and then went back home. 
So after we gathered the um, 61s, which are the complaint reports from the cops, and we reviewed the information where all these kids lived at, we started interviewing them one by one. And uh, we caught a break. I found this one kid who I spoke with who said to me that, uh, yes, that he indeed took a cab out from Long Island to Brooklyn to a party. We started putting two to two together, and we said, well, maybe we should call some car services in uh, the Long Island area. We call up uh, Nassau County, which we got nowhere with them, and then we called Suffolk County detectives. We spoke with the detectives on the phone, and they told us that they had somebody indeed that fit the description of Santa Claus who works in one of the car services out here. I said, great, you know, we're gonna come out and we'll meet up with you guys, but we may have to talk to this individual. So we uh, traveled out to Suffolk County from Brooklyn. The detectives took us over to the car service and the woman that worked the dispatch told us that uh, the person that we were looking for wasn't in today, he was off. But he had lived in the neighborhood and it seemed that everybody in the detectives in Suffolk County knew where this individual lived because he's kind of popular. We went to his house, we knocked on his door. His brother opened the door at first, he said, hey look, we're looking for your brother. And we sort of described him, you know, with the beard and the pop belly, look like Santa Claus. And he goes, yeah, it's my brother. He's, uh, he's home right now, what did he do? And I said, well, we'd rather not talk to you, we'd like to talk to your brother. So the brother let us in the apartment. And while we were in the apartment, I noticed all these paper bags on the floor. And I said, wow, did you just go shopping or something? I said, what are you doing with all these paper bags? And he goes, no, well, my brother's a uh, war veteran and he collects guns. We start looking in the bags and we notice all these guns, hundreds of rifles and handguns. So the brother comes out of the back and I was shocked along with the uh, Suffolk County detectives because they couldn't believe it either. He looks just like Santa Claus. He maybe a little shorter than I am, much shorter than I am, uh, round belly. The, the, the beard looked just like Santa. The one I am, Chris Kringle. He came out to us and we told him we wanted to talk to him. You guys came a long way, didn't you? Yeah, we did. I, I, I knew you'd find me sooner or later. He also told me that, uh, listen, um, I, I took his gun also. I said, really? He says, yeah, uh, I'll show you where it is. Ralph, how's This is my gun, the one I shot him with. Uh, There's his gun, and this is the other gun I had in my pocket as a backup, just in case the other one wouldn't work. So we um, took Santa Claus back with us in the car to Brooklyn. What the hell? And when we got to the precinct, the 81st precinct, and we started talking to him, he started crying. I mean, the man cried so, so much, cried like a baby. I mean, he was really, really upset. He felt so bad about uh, killing that man. He said that uh, he left them no choice. And then I asked him what happened, and he told me that uh, he picked up a fair in Brooklyn. He went out and dropped some kids off at a party. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good time at your party. Appreciate that, man. Right now. Take care. Uh, you safe out here. It's rough in the streets. Don't worry about me. He stopped off on Atlantic Avenue and he picked up a individual. Uh, because it was cold, he asked him to sit in the front seat so he could warm up a little bit. And while he was in the front seat, the uh, man said to uh, the guy who looks like Santa Claus, this is a stick up. And he goes, stick up, what do you mean? He goes, you know what it mean, old man, give me your money. And he goes, uh, you want all my money? He goes, yeah, I want all your money. Hey, you want the money in my left pocket? I said, yo, you want the money in my right pocket? He said, yeah, I want all your money. So I gave it to him. I gave it three, four times like that. I reached for my gun. He was walking. How about that? He didn't want to shoot him, but he was going to be either him or this other guy. He felt it was better to save his life. And after he shot him, he said that he opened the passenger door and he pushed him out into the street, closed his door, took off, and went back to his house in uh, Suffolk County, Long Island. He was very upset. Uh, we all sat him in the precinct and, and we notified the uh, district attorney, the riding DA, which we're always required to do when you work homicides. And once we called the DA, the DA came down. We felt really bad for him. 
because he was really the victim here, and he was scared for his life, and he chose to, to defend himself. The district attorney who came down felt the same way. As a matter of fact, she was almost in tears because she felt bad that he looked like Santa Claus and that uh, he was driving and then this individual tried to rob him. So she knew that he was gonna probably be acquitted or not be charged with the murder. He was not indicted by the uh, Brooklyn DA's office and uh, he was later let go. And I later became known as the detective that arrested Santa Claus. I was in the uh, police department for approximately 21 years. 10 of those years uh, were in uniform in the streets of East Harlem, and the other 11 were at the uh, detective division, working uh, homicide cases, missing person cases, assault cases, uh, all in the streets of, uh, of the Bronx. The victim in this crime was pretty punctual. He would uh, arrive at approximately 7 o'clock in the morning, his place of business on Jerome Avenue in the Bronx. His business was selling uh, garbage cans and plastic bags. Very lucrative business. When he arrived, there were uh, individuals waiting for him. He was stopped by a single individual who he was in conversation with for about 15 or 20 seconds. This individual at this point pulled out a gun and fired six times. He was brought to the hospital. A month later, he died and, and expired. The victim in this crime was pretty punctual. He would uh, arrive at approximately 7 o'clock in the morning in his place of business on Jerome Avenue in the Bronx. When he arrived, there were uh, individuals waiting for him. He was stopped by a single individual who pulled out a gun and fired six times. He was brought to the hospital. A month later, he died and, and expired. I began my investigation by interviews of his uh, wife, who in my first conversation with her, she explained to me that she had an insurance policy of $600,000 on him. And I was curious about how long he had it and who was paying for it. And she uh, stopped me dead in my tracks and requested a lawyer. That, that like really threw me off. Why, why does she want to be lawyered up? I'm trying to uh, solve the homicide of her husband. So now I had to really start thinking and saying, okay, this, maybe I'm, uh, I'm wrong here, you know? Maybe I should really take a real good look at her. The employees of the victim's company were adamant about if anybody had anything to do with the death of their boss, it would have been his business partner who was from Fairfield, New Jersey. $500,000 you took from me. I want it back, and I want it back now. The fella in Fairfield, New Jersey, had extended credit for plastic bags to the deceased, to the victim. If I don't get that money by tomorrow, you're a dead man. Damn it, am I the only one working around here? Come on! The head bookkeeper. She had basically told me of the scam that this individual was doing by skimming millions of dollars out of his company so he didn't have to pay taxes. Next call I made was to the Justice Department, and I was introduced to several investigators who, in the, in the beginning, were kind of like leery of uh, getting involved in the case until I explained the amount of money that was involved. OK, I got this, uh, uh, the wife of the victim with a uh, uh, heavy insurance policy. I have the uh, owner of the company that uh, supplied the deceased with uh, his product. I began to uh, scratch my head a bit now at, that, at this point. One of the interviews I conducted was with a driver of the main business associate of the company in Fairfield, New Jersey. I had asked him, I gave him a camera and asked him, could he just take pictures of, of anything during the day over at the company in Fairfield? I said, take pictures of, of everything, people, cars, uh, everything. And he did. And, and one of the pictures was a black pickup truck, Ford pickup truck. Bingo. 
That uh, particular vehicle was identified by witnesses and police officers in the Bronx as being on the scene when the homicide was uh, committed. This was the big break we were waiting for, the truck. I located the uh, owner, who was an employee of the company. I went to his residence upon arrival, myself and uh, one of the detectives from the Justice Department. We interviewed a female when we knocked on the door. She opened the door, we asked her name, and it was the, the, the same name as the owner of the vehicle. I proceeded to interview her. I could see she was very nervous. At that point, there's a knock on the door, and who is it? Her husband, the worker from the, uh, and owner of the, the truck. He was very friendly, came in. What are you guys doing here? I explain. Oh, you must be, uh, you're, you're the detective from the Bronx. I says, yeah, that's right, I'm the detective from the Bronx. After about 10 or 15 minutes, him and his wife went in the room together. They wanted to talk. I let him go in and they talk. They come out and he says, listen, I'm gonna give you everything. What, what can you help me out? I says, I can definitely help you out. I says, I can't promise you that you're gonna walk from this case, but if you come aboard, uh, I, I will bat for you. I'll, I'll get up and, uh, and, and help you. At this point, he gives me the whole thing about the case. At, at the job, my, my boss, he approached me. And uh, he was actually talking to me about you know, certain things that he needed to get done. He was approached by the president of the company and the vice president to kill the other business associate in the Bronx. I tried to just get away from that and told him that if anything, you know, whatever he wanted me to do, I can't do it. At that time, this individual had a reputation for being a little tough guy. It was not a tough guy. He was a pussycat. He's stated to them, I, I, I can't do this, but I can get people who can. I did talk to someone, but other than that, I ain't got nothing to do with that. He found two of his friends that were from the Washington Heights section of Manhattan, who he knew were bad. He contacted these two individuals, and they agreed for a sum of money to kill the other business associate in the Bronx. Upon receiving this information, I knew the wife was, was not involved. The owner of the vehicle agrees to put a wire on. And he states that at least once a week they have meetings in regards to this case. The uh, president of the company and the vice president and the uh, driver of the truck, they would go into a room that they thought was pretty safe, soundproof, that nobody could hear them talking. Okay, it's almost over but we gotta be on the same page. We gotta know what's going on. So what's the latest? Well, that detective, he came snooping around, but I didn't say one word. That guy from the Bronx? Yeah, a detective, you know. I know that detective. They came out and said that that dumb detective from the Bronx is too stupid and they'll never catch us. Just keep your head down, we'll be fine, it'll be over. The uh, meeting is over and we play the tape. I become the uh, center of the laugh. I'm the dumb mother detective from the Bronx. Okay. The district attorneys from the Justice Department and the district attorney from the Bronx figure, okay, we have a, we have a case here now. At that point, we uh, all gathered together and on a early morning hours, it was seven, eight o'clock, I said to the Justice Department people and the Postal Inspector, let's walk in and get them. Let's go. When I walked in with the other officers, the employees knew what was going on. They stood up and started clapping. I says, well, wait a minute. Where's the president of the company? He says, oh, he's out in the uh, factory area. He just exited the day. He must have seen you guys pulling up. So I proceeded out into the factory area, had my gun out, walked down this aisle, and found the president standing there. 
I asked him to uh, put his hands up on the wall and put his hands behind his back, and I proceeded to cuff him. While I was cuffing him, I said to him, do you know who I am? He says, no, I don't know who you are. And I said, I'm the dumb mother from the Bronx.